Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I will call this City Council business meeting to order. Tonight is Monday, December 18th, 2023, our last City Council meeting of the year. Thank you all for being here in the Council Chambers. Thanks to everybody who's watching at home. We will start our meeting as we always do. If you're able, please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, thanks for joining us this evening. Our agenda this evening uh, includes item 2.1, which is uh, some recognition for Councilmember Martin. This is his last council meeting and will recognize his service to the city of Bloomington. Under our consent agenda, Councilmember Carter has the consent agenda this evening and it's a hefty one, 24 items on tonight's consent agenda. As we move to hearings, resolutions and ordinances, we have five public hearings this evening and one opportunity for a public comment and that would be on item 4.6, our active transportation plan adoption. The public hearings we'll be holding, item 4.1 will be regarding the capital improvement plan. Uh, 4.2, the Northern Elite All-Stars change in condition. Item 4.3, uh, building expansion at 9200 Old Cedar Avenue. We will have a public hearing regarding 700 American Boulevard, the, uh, the rezoning and the uh, PDP and the FTP. And the public hearing under 4.5 4 is our miscellaneous issues ordinances for 2023, an annual event that we have every year where we look at our ordinances and look at for ways to update, improve, or, or edit them in some way. So those are our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances for the evening. Item five is our organizational business. Item 5.1, we will uh, provide a summary of the city manager performance evaluation and employment agreement, and we will end our meeting with item 5.2, the city council policy and issue update. Council, any changes or corrections to tonight's agenda? Seeing none, I would move approval of our agenda for this evening. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin to move uh, approval of our agenda this evening. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0 and we have an agenda. As I mentioned, item 2.1, uh, recognition of our council member Patrick Martin, his service to the city of Bloomington. This is his last council meeting. Patrick, I wanted to say thank you very much for your service to the city of Bloomington. It's greatly appreciated. Um, given your age, when you were first elected, I thought you had a chance to break all kinds of like, uh, longevity records here on the council, but uh, understand your, your, your need to step aside. And when you were elected, you were our, our most recent example of how every vote counts, or more accurately, how every six votes count, or however that worked. Uh, I appreciated that you took on your role. You took it on with enthusiasm, and you took it very seriously. And I admire that you took on your role with uh, some admirable empathy. I, I really do. I appreciated how you spoke clearly and broadly and empathetically for all the residents in District 4. I think, thought you did that very well. I've always appreciated your, your quick wit, your thoughtful comments, uh, that you didn't necessarily have to weigh in on every item all the time, which I, I really do appreciate that. Um, and I, I really did, uh, I, I appreciated that as you didn't weigh in every time, when you did weigh in, you were definitely worth listening to and appreciated all you had to say, so thank you. So again, thanks for your service to the city of Bloomington. Uh, I wish you and Sharon the absolute best and all good travels and, and success in, in the next adventure that you're taking on. I have no doubt that the two of you are gonna be wildly successful and wanted to congratulate and thank you so very much for your, your service to the city. So thank you. Council, anybody else wanna weigh in here? Anybody else wanna weigh in? If not, Councilmember Martin, anything to say? Thank you, and I appreciate the round of applause. I got one more whole meeting. I could biff it in the next three hours, but we'll, uh, I, I guess just, just real briefly, I remember walking around that first campaign, going to the Secretary of State and getting the CD of raw data and begging a friend to help me figure out how to turn it into a spreadsheet, and then having 300 printed pages that were blowing all over into people's yards. And the whole time, and watching council meetings and saying, like, holy cow, these folks up at the dais, these staff presentations that are so on point, like, this this feels insurmountable. Like, how, how do you get there? And then I'll say, getting there and having the privilege to serve for six years alongside all these folks and knowing that really it's just seven council members, uh, including the mayor, who are just good people that walked around with clipboards and pencils 
talking to neighbors, wanting to do good things. That there is there is no magic, there is no secret sauce. It's good people wanting to do good work. Uh, and I, I again, I've been honored to be able to do it alongside of folks that that give me a lot of hope and inspiration uh, that that things are going to be okay. And alongside that, I, I want to say a huge thank you to staff uh, to as we're up here trying to do good work to take. A lot of times very vague and, and sometimes meandering suggestions and turn them into concrete, actionable plans to make a meaningful difference in the life of the people that we get to serve, to take that that ambition and, and vision and good intentions and turn them into the new park, the street repaired, the, the lines in the ground, the, the stuff that, that gives the community hope that things will be okay, that the world will keep spinning. Um, and and I, I just think real quick, a, a great example that I had a time of sale inspection on Friday I called building inspections. They got somebody scheduled in within 48 hours. He was at my house. He was 40 minutes early. Peter, who's an incredibly nice guy that pointed out a couple of things that needed to get fixed, he guided me through a, what is a really anxious time and said, don't worry about it. We'll get this buttoned up. It'll be all right. Good luck to you. I'm so excited for you. And to think that there are tens of thousands of those interactions happening every month across the city uh, with such professionalism, I, I think speaks to how this city is, is run and operates. And, then, and just finally, thank you to the residents of, of District 4 who, when this kind of schmo showed up at the door with the, all the papers and the, and the clipboard and said, I, what do you think? What are you excited about? What do you dream about? What do you need fixed? Where do you want to go? I said, I, I trust that guy, and I think he should have one of those chairs up at the dais to, to get the work done, and, and I wouldn't be here without that opportunity and their trust. So, again, it's when you compliment me on brevity, I'm going to go the opposite direction. But... Um, <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. This means a lot. And of course, it's not official until I give you a plaque, so you have to. Uh... Next up on our agenda this evening is our consent agenda. Councilmember Carter, as I said, has our consent calendar tonight. Councilmember Carter. All right. So um, I, of course, will be holding item 3.1. Do we have any other holds? Last call. All right. So with that, I would move to approve items 3.2 through 3.24. Second. We've got a motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember Moore to accept tonight's uh, consent agenda, item 3.2 through 3.24. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Carter. All right, so 3.1 is a resolution to accept donations, and we have uh, several tonight. So we have a donation um, from Nicholas Tetner in memory of Lawrence Tetner, and then another one um, by Amy Wendell in memory of Adolph Wendell, and these are both for... Uh, donations to Duan Golf Course, uh, so very appreciative of that. Um, and then we have several, or a handful here, to the Bloomington Police Department, um, monetary donations, and then some also some dog food, which is always appreciated at the animal shelter. Uh, and then several to public health, so from the United Way, Bundles of Love, and St. David's Center for Child and Family Development. So um, really appreciate the donations from community members and community partners, and then would ask staff to write the relevant thank yous. And with that, I will move to approve item 3.1. Second. Motion by Council Member Carter, second by Council Member Mua to accept item 3.1, the resolution to accept donations is part of our consent agenda. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, Council Member Carter. Which leads us right into our uh, hearings, resolutions, and ordinances for the evening. Item four on our agenda. Item 4.1 is a public hearing, and this is regarding the approval of our 2024 through 2033 Capital Improvement Plan, our CIP. And Lori Economy Scholler, our Chief Finance Officer here in the City of Bloomington, is going to tee this up for us. 
Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. As Matt has the slides started for me there. Um, as you mentioned, this is our CIP, our Capital Improvement Plan for 2024 through 2033. It is a 10-year plan. Um, this 10-year uh, Capital Improvement Plan aligns with our mission. Thanks, Matt to cultivate an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. This plan aligns with our, um, and, and it will enable the city to build a connected and welcoming community, a healthy community, and a community with equitable economic growth. Is there a specific direction to There are just a couple of agenda areas, our, our purpose and timelines. The CIP's purpose is, is, is a planning tool. Um, it is a long range planning tool. Again, it's 10 years. Um, so we are looking both short term, what we think the city will do in capital project activities and improvements and um, Now to work? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, again, so it's a planning tool, and it is not an authorization to move forward until the council has all the funding sources. So um, right now it, it includes a detailed description of projects that are 50,000 or above. Um, all capital projects are listed in the individual budgets, but if they're a project of less than 50,000, um, it doesn't appear in this document. And then um, we have an executive summary at the beginning of the document. It's a 300 page document. And then this highlights in each of the categories projects that are a million dollars or above. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it does not guarantee the project moving forward. Um, all the funding sources normally need to be um, brought forward um, that the revenue is all there coming in um, before the expenditures are authorized by the council. So um, we work on that as a purpose statement. And then the procurement is an, under the normal process. So under our procurement rules, anything under $175,000 is approved by the city manager. Anything above will be on a council agenda, just like this evening's agenda. There's a project moving forward. Um, the normal planning occurred with this timeline. Uh, spring and summer of 23, we worked through the document and defined the projects. We brought to um, the city council the draft document in October. The planning commission uh, provided their um, resolution that the document is in compliance with our comprehensive plan on November 16th. And, this, and tonight it's um, the final document is before you for the public hearing and acceptance of, of the document. And then there were some updates since our October meeting, and one of them was an election for um, a referendum of a local option sales tax. And so we changed in the document for the three projects um, from other sources to local sales tax. And then um, the bonding, the state bonding program piece had not been added in, and we added those in to there. So those for the Bloomington Forward projects, that has been updated in this revised document. And then there was several um, pieces in the parks where there might have been some duplications or where we had um, looked at some pieces where they um, might be from charter bonds or park development funds and we shifted some of those around depending on the sources and the years on the park projects. And both Anne and Renee are here if there's questions on that. Um, for bonding information, this is what we look to at least start in 2024 is we would probably have the um, late spring um, Bryant and Trepa uh, charter bonds before the city council. We would also have um, probably sales tax bonds um, October, November timeframe before the city council for the Bloomington Ice Garden. And we would also have the permanent improvement bonds in the fall. Um, for the PIR projects, PMP projects. 
So those would be the three bond sales that I would anticipate. And um, early spring, we'll probably have a conversation about um, just where the debt sat and where we're thinking with how the CIP is currently built and how that looks up for the council. So with the approval of this, um, we kind of take this as a green light that we can start at least the design and a little bit of the, the work on some of these projects so that um, as we're coming up to the year that they're occurring in, we can be um, moving in a much quicker pace. So um, right now, projects for 24 and 25 are on the green light and we're moving forward with them. Some of the ones in 24, you kind of green lighted last year, like the Bryant and Trepper Parks. So I just want to keep the procurement and the processing moving. And that concludes um, the slides I have for you. So I have, if you have any questions, please let me know, or it's up to the public hearing time. Thank you. Council, we went through this, uh, an extensive presentation and discussion on this back in October, as uh, Ms. Economy Shoulder said, but are there any additional questions that have come up since then as we head into the uh, approval process or the public hearing this evening? All right, I don't see any. Very good, thank you very much. Don't go far in case there are questions that come up. And with that, this is a public hearing and I will open the public hearing at item 4.1. This is a public hearing regarding the 2024 through 20, 2033 capital improvement plan approval. Is there anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.1 this evening? Mr. Brillard, is there anyone on the phone wishing to speak? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I do see one phone number uh, on the roll here, but given that we have five public hearings and a public comment opportunity, we'll find out uh, what item they're wishing to speak on. Caller with the phone number beginning with 952-232. You're looking to speak on item 4.1? I am not. I'm on item 4.3. Thank you very much. Very good. Last call for anybody in the council chambers? Council, no one coming forward, no one in the on the phone uh, to speak to 4.1. Uh, with that, I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.1. So moved. Motion by council member Martin, second by council member D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.1. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0, closing the public hearing. Council, any questions or any comments regarding this capital improvement plan? As I said, we had a pretty lengthy discussion in October, reiterating once again that it is indeed a plan, and uh, the plan only moves forward when we're absolutely ready to move forward in terms of timing, in terms of project availability, and most importantly, in terms of the money to do the projects. And so it's a, it is a plan. Nothing there is set in stone, uh, but it kind of guides us and, and provides us from provides us some good foundational support when we're looking to apply for a grant and um, the foundational support for this kind of thing, financial information. So, Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, probably a question for you, Ms. Economy Schuler. Um, the, um, I, are there, are there um, charter bonds that are, um, I don't know what the right word is, like they're not expiring, they're coming due, are we paying them off, I guess? Like, is there, is there a net addition in terms of the bonds that we might choose to, to throw out here, I think the 210 million or whatever it was, or do we have some bonds coming that are, that are you know, that we're paying off that would like, does this roll in terms of our overall debt load, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm sorry, that's a convoluted question, but I'm curious if it makes sense. Mayor and Council Member D'Alessandro, we, we have a maturities and um, outstanding debt. Um, the only area that currently, um, has where one is coming on and one is coming on is our PIR bonds. Um, so, because we've had this program since the 90s, um, we and they're all 10-year bonds. So, after 10 years, 11th year, one falls off and we have another one coming on. So, there's always a net in that category. On the charter bonds, um, we've only issued a couple issues and they're not 10 years old yet. So, um, but there's maturities and principal payment down every year on that. Council, any additional questions? If there are no questions, Council, I would look for action on item 4.1. Council Member Martin. Uh, Mayor, I'm happy to make the motion. Council Member Martin. I will move that we adopt a resolution approving the city's capital improvement plan for the years 24 through 33. 
Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman to approve the city's capital improvement plan for the years 2024 through 2033. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Economy Scholler, and everybody who worked on that capital improvement plan. Moving on to item 4.2, a second public hearing of the evening. This is regarding a change in condition with our friends at Northern Elite All-Stars. And uh, Mr. Uh, Centenario is here this evening. Good evening and welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. I have a very brief presentation for you tonight. And so this, this public hearing before you is related to, it's a highly technical matter, specifically a change of condition of approval. Uh, Northern Elite received approval to operate their facility back in 2016, and uh, they're doing very well, and they want to expand. And so uh, 2000 West 98th is very close to where we're at tonight, uh, and it's been a popular choice for athletic training facilities, very convenient location. Uh, I'm assuming that the interior space works very well for uh, this type of use, and there are several. Uh, these athletic training facilities within uh, within the building. So what's on screen is the floor plan, and this is a, you know, what the applicant would like to do. Uh, they want to expand about 6,200 square feet into a tenant bay immediately next to where they operate today. Uh, so roughly 50% uh, expansion. Uh, the two, if, you know, the, you divide it into three, three spaces. The right two are where they are operating today. The yellow area is, um, is where they want to expand. And so staff is, we're very supportive of this. We, we don't see uh, any concerns with expansion, uh, but we do need to ensure that um, we're following all the appropriate processes. Where am I supposed to point this? <laughs> you can just sort of answer, please. Thank you. Uh, there's an exi existing condition of approval from 2016, and that is this this use or this business has to operate uh, in accordance to the floor plan that was approved in 2016. Well, this is the floor plan that was approved in 2016, where uh, we had more concerns about how the overall site would function and operate with several of these athletic training facilities. And while it can get busy sometimes, we haven't observed or heard of any significant problems. Um, and so there was a parking study that was done years, years ago and it seems to have worked out, uh, be working out really well. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind advancing that, Matt, thank you. And so it's very, what we're proposing for you tonight uh, is very simple. Uh, we're just asking you to approve a change that allows the planning manager to uh, accept modifications to the floor plan, essentially allowing for the expansion to move forward. One more minute. And with that, our <clears throat> we do have a recommendation for you there. Thank you, Mr. Centenario. Council, any questions of Mr. Centenario this evening on this one? Pretty straightforward, I think. All right, no questions. With that, I will open this public hearing on item 4.2 regarding the change in condition for the Northern Elite All Stars. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.2 this evening? Don't see anyone. Mr. Billard, anyone on the phone? <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, no one knew. No one knew, thank you. Last call for anybody in the council chambers regarding 4.2. Council, uh, no one in the chambers coming forward, no one on the phone wishing to speak down in 4.2. I look for a motion to close the public hearing on 4.2. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Carter, second by Council Member D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.2. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Council, any questions on this? Uh, Council Member D'Alessandro. Just a, a quick one. Do, it, with the change that we're making here, does the the do does this go basically on consent agenda at, for us to approve at some point, or is it like literally we don't even hear about it anymore? Mr. Mayor, Council Members, this would likely be the last you'd see of this particular uh, application. Uh, the applicant has already has a building permit on standby, uh, waiting for your action, and then. Uh, you probably see some some minor construction traffic uh, on site. Very good. And I will say this is, I'm, I'm glad to see this. I drive past that 
building often, and it is always full, always full. So uh, very well done in terms of finding the correct use there and, and making it worthwhile and useful for a lot of different folks. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I did have one question. Um, is, is there any idea of how long this expansion is going to support the, 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 the business? Um, just wondering if it's going to come back to us again in like a year or two, and then we'd have to go through this again. So just thinking long term if we have to uh, – if this is going to fit into the future, or is it going to come back later? Uh, Mayor and Council Members, that's a great question. I, the applicant is, is here. They probably better uh, answer it than I could. Uh, but in terms of a process, uh, you know, if they want to keep expanding, what we're probably going to have to do is uh, consider a new conditional use permit. And that would go before the, there would be a public hearing at the Planning Commission. And we could consider how that expansion relates to uh, traffic and parking needs and some of the other concerns that we might have with a significant expansion. Good with that, Councilmember Moore. Yeah, they said a question. On just, just the. I think the question is how long before your continued success leads to you outgrowing the facility. Well, we've been here for. I'm sorry, if you could just identify yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Karen Moore. I'm the owner of Northern Elite. Welcome. Um, thank you. And we have been in the facility f space for about seven years. And we are at that point where we expanded into this space from Egan originally. And it took about seven years for us to now kind of outgrow or want to continue to grow where we're at. So I would love to say I'll see you in a year. <laughs> I doubt that will happen, though. Um, but we, we utilize the space efficiently so we can use every corner to make sure it's you know, successful with the space that we're, we've been given. So. Does that answer? Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you much. Council, additional questions? If not, uh, I would look for action on M4.2, the uh, change in condition for Northern Elite All-Stars. Happy to make the motion, Mr. Mayor. Council Member D'Alessandro. I will move to adopt a resolution approving a change of condition to allow expansion of an existing sports training facility at 2000 West 98th Street. Second. Motion by Council Member D'Alessandro, second by Council Member Carter to approve a change of condition allow, allowing the expansion of an existing sports training facility at 2000 West 98th Street. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Item 4.3 on our agenda is our third public hearing of the evening. This is regarding a building expansion. This is our BP, the BP at 9200 Old Cedar Avenue. And I believe Liz O'Day from our planning staff is here. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. All right. Yep, thank you. All right. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Item 4.3 on your agenda this evening is for a rezoning uh, to apply the plan development overlay district and to convert and development plans to convert the existing car wash into a retail space and then uh, expand uh, into a new car wash space and parking lot improvements located at the BP at 9200 Old Cedar Avenue South. Uh, so I'm sure you're all familiar with this intersection. It's a very prominent intersection in Bloomington um, at Old Cedar and Old Shakopee. Uh, surrounding land uses include single family to the east, apartment building to the south, commercial shopping center to the west, and kind of auto-related auto uses to the north. Um, so the applicant isn't proposing to change. Oops, hold on back up. Um, so this is an image looking at... Um, Looking southeast, the existing gas station has a brick exterior and they aren't planning to change the existing canopy or touch um, the existing building. Mainly what they're doing is an expansion as well as some parking lot improvements. So the base zoning B2 isn't proposed to be changed. They are um, going, to plan, uh, going to the plan development overlay district to uh, ask for some development flexibility. So this is the uh, site plan. The area, um, expanded area, is outlined, outlined in red. This would hold the new car wash, uh, mechanical room, and trash room. 
Uh, when there is an expansion that exceeds 25% or more of the floor area, you have to come into conformance with a number of um, site characteristics, and those site character characteristics include parking, lighting, landscaping, and other items. So um, they are required to come into conformance with the multiple of different things here today, and um, that's why they're coming forward with the plan development overlay. Um, and ultimately, the expansion is 35, or not 35, 1,300 square feet. Uh, so this is the um, site plan again, and then what they're showing is uh, some deviation requests related to parking lot islands. That is a conformance trigger that they have to come into conformance with, um, and parking lot islands are required at the ends of each parking row, and they have to be eight feet wide. Um, so what they're proposing is let me move this real quick. So they have to install, code requires the six parking islands circled in red, and what they're proposing to um, install are the ones shown in blue. Um, and staff is ultimately in favor of the development flexibility request due to um, investment into a commercial node, as well as um, coming into conformance with lighting and landscaping, as well as burying of a above ground um, propane tank. Um, and this isn't a development um, flexibility request, it's just a minor re revision, but ultimately they're showing um, an eight foot uh, wide sidewalk south of the driveway, but they're not showing it continuing north. So just a minor um, tweak that they have to show before the permit. And then another development uh, flexibility request that they're asking for is related to foundation plantings. What the code requires is 50% of foundation, 50% of the facade along the street has to have foundation plantings. <coughs> and so on my screen, you can see the areas that are required for foundation plantings in red. Um, and they are, um, they are not showing any foundation planting, so they are asking for that development flexibility and staff is supportive because they're um, adding a number of new trees on the site and um, it is a fairly tight site, so adding foundation plantings may impact sidewalks and drive, uh, drive lanes. And this is the floor plan, highlighted in blue is the existing car wash, and then basically they're shifting it um, to the yellow space that is the car wash where the entrance is on the south, and then exit is on the north of the site. So with car wash uses, um, noise is a huge uh, factor in our development application. Um, so they did hire ESI engineering to do a noise study um, and the car wash hours of operation are from seven to 10. So we are not um, using the nighttime noise limits which are more stringent. So just the daytime noise levels would apply. Um, and so there, the noise study recommendation uh, ultimately said that with both doors closed, that it does um, meet the code requirements. If one of the doors are open, it does exceed um, the noise levels. So staff is recommending that the doors be closed um, to comply with the noise. <clears throat> and so staff is recommending approval. Planning Commission also recommended ap approval. Um, Adam Peterson, the person that previously spoke, is on the WebEx for any questions. Thank you. Council, any questions of Ms. O'Day here regarding item 4.3, the expansion of the BP at 9200 Old Cedar Avenue? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Was there any discussion um, at, uh, at, at Planning Commission or within staff about the... Um, I don't want to say compliance with or, or the, the this as a as a use compared to what we were trying to do at that intersection from a, a you know a, a development node perspective. I was just kind of curious if if the the use case here not that not that we can do anything necessarily about it, but um, I know that we've been talking about that particular area as a as an opportunity zone for us from a both a community development perspective as well as a um, um, 
you know, I don't know if the port was looking at it, but an economic development area. So I'm kind of curious if, if that discussion happened. And if so, what, what were the, the discussion items related to um, how that complies or doesn't comply with what people were thinking about might be there? For, for example, I think we even had an intersection study going on there, right? So the potential for a roundabout or whatever that was going on, how does that all fit together? If you could help out with that, would be great. I'll try to tackle it, and then if someone from the port or Mike Centenario could help out, um, we're more familiar with that commercial node study. Um, so staff didn't have um, kind of any particular discussion around the commercial node. I will say it to the point of the, uh, the redesign of the um, intersection when the roundabout, roundabout um, study, I think that's pretty far in the future. So in terms of like that sidewalk that we're requiring them to expand, um, that could ultimately change several years down the line. But we thought the time is now. Let's make them expand that sidewalk now um, while we have it in front of us. Um, but as far as the commercial node aspect, I am not as familiar with that project. Um, and it didn't come up in any kind of our discussions. I, I see Mr. Centenario. Yeah, Lurking, <laughs> coming forward. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to address the question about planning commission specifically, uh, the, the use as a whole in this location was not a discussion point. Namely, it's an existing use, uh, and the expansion is you know, significant in the sense of like an aesthetic improvement, uh, but not, it's not a major change to the use or the characteristics of, of the use. So uh, it wasn't something that we discussed. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so then, uh, you know, just kind of looking at this in terms of the, the noise component of it with the doors closed, uh, and I know we've had uh, conversations about other noise situations across the city, um, and I understand that there hasn't been a history of, of noise, but I'm just more curious uh, when I ask this question. You know, if they aren't able to get the door closed and there are noise complaints, what, what's the, um, what can be done uh, to try to, you know, is there any way to fix that that issue if, if there's a problem there with that? And have we had to do that any other place in the city? Um, you know, given that you know where this is located at, and I, I mean, they, they've had a car wash there for a while, so it's more just a curiosity question um, uh, since there were those concerns with the uh, uh, with the, the noise with the doors being closed. Sure. So, uh, Mayor and Councilmember Lohman, we do have a condition um, on the application that they have to comply with noise at all times. Um, and so um, that is a state requirement. That's where they have the rules are the, um, the state has the noise regulations. And if there is a complaint that our environmental health department would come out and do an inspection and then we would take action from there. Um, as far as other sites, I know the Tommy's car wash is just under construction now, and I'm not aware of any other kind of complaints from other car washes in the city. Excellent. So there's a process in place uh, that would be able to uh, rectify uh, any of those situations if they uh, occur. And of course, obviously, they've had one there for a while, so you know we would have seen something. But just more of a curiosity uh, for those neighbors that are there. Thank you. Yep. And I will say, Councilmember Lohman, I think I'm sure we've all been in more than one car wash where it doesn't even fire up until the door behind you closes. And uh, so it's it's a uh, it's a good compromise, I think, to maintain uh, a little bit of peace and quiet or, or manage the noise a little bit better uh, with with the automation not even beginning until that door is closed. So yeah, I'd be shocked if, if that ever was an issue. But I was just more curious. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Council, any additional questions, Councilmember Nelson? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Just two quick questions. One, uh, with the car wash being new, where there will there be any enhancements um, in terms of water reclamation, um, water use, uh, or other environmental factors on this? Uh, Mayor and Council, that's I am not aware of anything, but that might be a better question for the applicant. Um, Fair enough. On the WebEx. Okay. And the, the second question, this is a PD, and the reason we had to go with that is because of the deviations that they're requesting? Correct. Okay, so they, they won't be able to meet the parking islands. They're modified. They're getting better, but they're not quite there. Is that, and the uh, public sidewalk will be close but not completely meeting the requirement? Sort of, um, Mayor and Council. So the two deviations that they're formally requesting are for the foundation plantings along the building and then the parking islands and then the related to the sidewalk. That's something that they can um, 
fix. They're not asking for a particular deviation. It's just a revision that we need to see before the building permit. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And uh, Councilmember Nelson, do we want to get to the applicant to answer the questions? That, no. No, I, I don't believe we do. Okay. So, okay. Good to know. Thanks. Also, anything else? Hearing none, I will open the public hearing. Thank you, Ms. O'Day. Don't go far. Uh, we will open the public hearing on item 4.3 regarding the building expansion at 9200 Old Cedar Avenue, and this is for the uh, preliminary and final development plans. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.3 this evening? No one coming forward? Mr. Sable, uh, is there anyone you, on the phone? Thank you, Mayor. Council members, no one on the line. Well, I, I believe we didn't, we said we had somebody on 4.3. Oh, next item. I'm sorry, 4.4. My apologies. 4.4. Last call for anybody in the cha in the chambers. Council, no one coming forward, no one on the phone. I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.3. So move. Second? <laughs> I'll do a second to Martin's passing. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman to close the public hearing on item 4.3. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 with Councilmember Mua having stepped away for just a moment here. Council, any any questions or, or anything we need to resolve or, or straighten out before we take action on item 4.3? If not, I will look for a motion. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I will move that we adopt an ordinance amending the zoning map by rezoning 9200 Old Cedar Avenue South, B2 General Commercial to B2 PD General Commercial Plan Development. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman to adopt the ordinance amending the zoning map by rezoning 9200 Old Cedar Avenue South. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Councilmember Martin. Uh, Mayor, I will move that we approve preliminary and final development plans to convert the existing car wash to retail space, build a new car wash and parking lot improvements at 9200 Old Cedar Avenue, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to approve the preliminary and final development plans at, for 9200 Old Cedar Avenue. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to 4.4. Ms. Odea is still with us for this one. This is our, our fourth public hearing of the evening, and this is regarding the rezoning, the preliminary and final development plans for 700 American Boulevard West. Ms. Odea. Yes. Thank you. All right, item 4.4. Um, this is a development proposal for a currently vacant uh, parcel at 700 American Boulevard West, which entails a rezoning um, to RM100 and preliminary and develop final development plans for a five-story, 128 senior apartment building with 1,500 square feet of commercial space. So this is the northwest corner of Lindale and American Boulevard. Goodwill and Luther Acura are across Lindale Avenue. REI is to the north, and the REI Bauer Hockey site shares access with the subject site, and then top line credit union is to the west. So this is an image from, from 2003, um, which you can see the site was previously used as an automotive and industrial use. And then the city uh, acquired both the 900 and 700 American Boulevard uh, properties as part of the expansion for uh, Lindale and American. And then the site has had multiple rounds of RFPs. The first was for uh, Fraunchu for a medical office development, and then for hy V for a health market concept. Both com concepts ultimately didn't come to fruition. And then before you this evening, um, last year, Shaford Richardson was chosen as the developer for the site. Existing conditions uh, images, this is looking north uh, east, and then it shows the REI access, and then uh, another view looking at Lindale Avenue, just to give you a flavor of what's currently out there today. And then this is uh, an image of the rezoning. Um, they're proposing a rezoning from B2 to RM100 uh, with the planned development overlay. 
And here is uh, kind of a concept site plan. Uh, the development is a five-story, 128 unit with surface parking and one level of underground parking. Uh, there is a commercial component, which is roughly 1,500 square feet, which is circled in red, uh, located at the corner of the site. And then this is a fully affordable development with 25 units at 50% AMI and 102 units at 60% AMI. So a deviation that is being requested is related to the side yard um, setback. Um, so we're looking at the west side of the site along the shared access. Code requires 18 foot 3, where they're showing 10 foot 9. Uh, due to the location of the shared access, the reduced um, setback has an in insignificant um, impact to the adjacent property, also shifting um, the setback to meet Shifting the setback to meet the required setback um, could result in a loss of units, which we didn't want to see. And then another deviation is related to the 20-foot landscape yard. Elements permitted within a landscape yard are like landscaping, uh, sidewalks, driveways, um, and they're sh currently showing a public plaza, which is uh, has an 8-foot setback from the property line. And staff is ultimately supportive of this deviation as the plaza really activates the corner um, with various features and improves walkability. Um, and it's just a nice addition to the corner. Uh, this is the landscape plan. Ultimately, the landscaping quantity is uh, in compliant. In fact, they're kind of going above and beyond in the number of um, shrubs and plantings um, quantity. And um, a couple minor tweaks are needed here, not development flexibility, um, but they need to show foundation plantings and a couple trees in the parking islands. And then here is a um, building rendering looking from uh, the intersection of Lendale and American. The building materials are a mix of uh, metal panel, fiber cement, glass, and brick. And then you can see the plaza and the retail component uh, face in the corner. And then lastly, regarding uh, parking, the applicant is taking advantage of the OHO uh, reduction, parking reduction incentive. Uh, with the reduction, they are required 162 spaces with 165 spaces uh, provided. So they are not seeking any further reduction of parking. And then for the record, it's imperative that they manage um, parking appropriately because there is no um, on-street parking uh, nearby that is available. So with that, staff is recommending approval, and the applicants from Chaford Richardson, excuse me, are in the audience tonight. Thank you very much. Council questions. Councilmember Lohman. Yeah, thanks. So uh, uh, I just wanted to go back a little bit to that that deviation uh, with the building uh, side yard setback, and. You know, obviously, we want to do it, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not questioning that. But in, in doing that, what's what's the impact? Um, you know, we, we know we have this the standard here, and and, and obviously, um, you know, we're not going to follow that. You know, what, what's what's the impact of, of doing something like that? Uh, Mayor and Council, so the the side yard setback is um, it's a calculation based on the height of the building. Um, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it's 10 feet plus so-and-so inches above a certain um, height. So that's how we arrived at the 8-foot uh, 3 requirement. I know that seems like an odd number, but that's, that's how we arrived at that requirement. Uh, the impact, uh, as you can see, there's um, this light green, um, I think, is a sidewalk. Um, and then this darker green is the... Um, is a landscaping area. So ultimately, it's a kind of a close-ish um, area between the sidewalk and um, the building itself, but staff didn't see any kind of true impact because um, there is that shared access directly right here. So there's not any kind of impact. Okay, so no, it wouldn't be like a, and something yeah. else would, would be, would be, a, be a problem with that. Okay, right. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any kind of safety. And I assume not, you, staff wouldn't, would, wouldn't do that. I'm just, just kind of curious about that, you know, in terms of that. Um, uh, so I, I have a different policy question about that, but it's not appropriate at this time. But uh, uh, thank you. Council, mm -hmm. additional questions? Councilmember Nelson. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just can you quickly summarize how this differs from what the original plan was, the RFP plan? Um, I might need to call on someone who's more familiar with the RFP, uh, but ultimately, uh, Mayor and Council, um, the original plan did not call for um, age restricted. Um, this is senior apartments, as well as the um, previous appro uh, proposal called for more units. This is 128. I think they're um, looking at doing like 150 some units. Um, and then it was also slightly taller, uh, one story taller. Do uh, we have information in regards to how many um, units would have been affordable at different levels in the original RFP? I do not, but I'm sure the applicant would have okay. that information. And then is but there a change if in? If I could, I, I could maybe, I, I know that Mr. Markegaard is online. Uh, maybe we could bring Mr. Markegaard in to answer some of the RFP questions because I think he worked more closely on okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor Bussey, Council members. I don't know if you if you heard the discussion or not. Uh, Council Member Nelson had a couple of questions regarding how this how the the, the final development plan uh, differs from the original RFP that was set out. Uh, if you could just summarize that, that would be helpful. Sure. Yeah, I, th I believe Ms. O'Day covered uh, most of the items. One other uh, differentiation was the reduction in the commercial space. Uh, I'm not sure if that was mentioned, 5,000 square feet down to 1,500 square feet. In terms of the affordability, uh, I believe it was 100% affordable uh, originally, so that is not an amendment. In terms of the details on number of units, I'd have to look back on that or, or refer to the applicant. Council Member Nelson, any additional questions? No, that's what I wanted to know. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for chiming in, Mr. Markegaard. Appreciate it. Anything else, Council? Uh, you said the applicant was here. Did they? Was there anything to add from the applicant? Or yeah, please. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Katie Anthony, Vice President of Development with Schaefer Richardson. Uh, our office is located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council uh, for your time today, and thank you to uh, Ms. O'Day on her presentation. Uh, the one thing I wanted to touch on is exactly what Council Member Nelson brought up. Uh, I think you've seen this proposal a couple of times in the last year. One was with regards to the initial RFP as well as uh, uh, ap uh, our application for uh, a resolution for uh, housing conduit bonds for the affordability aspect of it. Um, as uh, Council Member Nelson observed, uh, there are changes in this proposal from what you approved uh, and signed off on about a year ago. And I want to walk through how we got to that point. So the original proposal was for 153 units. It was a six story building with underground parking as well as some surface parking. Um, we had proposed 118 parking stalls and a mix of one through three bedroom units. Uh, so. Today, you have 128 units, a five-story building with an expanded level of underground parking and surface parking uh, for a total of 165 parking stalls. Uh, and I want to touch specifically on that. So, um, And then the commercial space uh, reduction from 5,000 to 1,500 square feet. Uh, as we started working with, uh, with the city departments and with the Port Authority on our original plan, uh, as well as some of the members of the Public Works Department, um, it became clear that uh, parking would really drive the ultimate site plan uh, here. And when we put together our original proposal, we did observe that what we had proposed did not follow to the letter of the zoning code uh, what could be done on the site. Um, we have developed uh, hundreds of units, thousands of units of housing, hundreds of units of affordable housing, uh, and based on our observations and our data on, on parking specifically, uh, put together a proposal with the original RFP that, uh, that we felt uh, was, was sufficient from a parking perspective for the housing count. Um, through close work with the, with the city, uh, a parking study that ensued uh, as part of the requirements, it became clear that uh, that the site would not support uh, 
would not support that number of units and be able to provide the parking needed to meet the city's requirements. Uh, and so that's how we kind of scaled back the plan uh, to something that would meet would, would fall within uh, what the city requires for parking um, and, uh, and still maximize the number of units that we could get on the site. Uh, likewise, the, the change from uh, from family housing and a little bit of the unit mix was driven by that parking uh, that parking study as well. So trying to maintain uh, some density on the site, maintain the number of units, um, uh, the maximum number of units that uh, that the site could hold, as well as kind of balancing that parking requirement. That is how we ended up at the the proposal that you see in front of you today. Our original proposal as part of the RFP had uh, a parking ratio of 0.77 per unit. Uh, this proposal and, and in this proposal, we are uh, taking advantage of, uh, of the city's uh, opportunity housing ordinance uh, and the parking reduction that comes from that. Uh, with, the, with the parking reduction, with the OHO uh, granted because of the affordability on the property, we're at a 1.29 parking stalls per unit ratio. Uh, the zoning code without the OHO would require 1.5 parking stalls per unit. So you can see the many iterations and really close work with, uh, with the city staff and the port um, to get to the point where we are today. A few of the key goals that were outlined in the RFP that we, we used as our, our guidelines for today's proposal. Uh, include uh, a mix of uses, so both residential and commercial in in the uh, Lindale Avenue retrofit plan area, uh, a desire for a diverse, walkable, and compact development, uh, affordable housing being a, a, an important driver for the city-owned site, um, and activating the corner. And so uh, there is a lot of push and pull to get where we are today. That is why this proposal is different from what you saw a year ago. Um, it is the same as what you saw uh, with the housing conduit bond proposal uh, that we ran through a, a month or so ago. Um, and we're really excited about this development. We've been wanting to do work in the city of Bloomington for a while. Uh, we know the site has its challenges as evidenced by the history of of redevelopment and the proposals that haven't happened. Uh, we think that adding housing to this site uh, will be important to find that diversified mix in this area. There is a lot of commercial, there is some housing that's come in. It's a nice uh, segue from kind of stepping down from the commercial area into more uh, some lower density uh, residential as you move further south. Um, and we're just excited to be here. I'm happy to take questions. I'm not sure if that's appropriate right now, uh, but happy to answer any questions that, that you all have for us. I think that's appropriate to consider questions. Council, any questions of, uh, of Ms. Anthony this evening? Council Member Nelson? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. If there was greater flexibility on the parking, could you get more units in there? And do you think it would work? Yes. Thank you. Councilmember Moore. Thank you. Um, I'd like to better understand how you, um, the commercial space went from 5,000 down to 1,500. Sure. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Moa, and the council. Uh, yes. So the reduction of density and kind of reworking the economics of the site, we needed to scale back the, the commercial space as well. Uh, Ground floor retail and new construction is has its challenges in terms of finding occupants for that space. Um, in addition to that, the financing sources for affordable housing find uh, commercial space challenging. So um, it's, it's a push and pull in terms of kind of the economics of what drives, so how much of, of your your revenue comes from housing versus how much of your revenue comes from commercial space and what the investors for affordable housing like to see. Um, and so kind of it's, it's a combination of things. One is kind of the, the scale of, of residential compared to the scale of commercial space, um, and also just the, the kind of inherent need to scale down the space in order to maximize the number of units that we could get. <coughs> Any additional questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for the information, and thanks for being with us this evening. Yep. Thank you. Stick around in case there's additional questions here. Do. Very good. Council, if there's no additional questions, I'm going to open the public hearing. Uh, this will be our public hearing on item 4.4.
which is for 700 American Boulevard West. This is for the rezoning, the preliminary, and the final development plan. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.4 this evening? Good evening, if you could please uh, identify yourself for the record. And we do, uh, within our public hearings, we've got a five minute limit per speaker. We have a shot clock on the walls to keep track of things. And uh, when we get to the five minutes, I'm afraid I will cut you off, not because I'm mean, but because we wanna make sure that everybody gets the same amount of time and we're, we're uh, equitable to everyone. So it's all good. good evening, well, welcome. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Kim Nelson with North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. Uh, we represent 28,000 construction workers in the upper Midwest, many who live right here in Bloomington. Um, you all know we love economic development and we love building things. Um, however, we, we uh, have to keep the workers in mind as we do so. And so I'm here tonight to highlight a if, few if things. You could, uh, if you could lower the mic just a little bit to make sure, sure. that we pick you up go. perfect. Thank there you so much. Um, so I'm here to, to highlight a few, few concerns that we have. Um, you all know our staff has tracked in detail for over eight years now in the Twin Cities area, the construction industry. Um, we chat, track developers, general contractors, their primary subs, subcontractors, labor brokers, workers, and other associates, and anything related to a construction site in the Twin Cities area. We have all that in detail. Um, with that said, that puts us at the forefront of working to deter a couple of problems that are major problems in our industry, worker misclassification, um, uh, labor exploitation, which oftentimes crosses over in, into human trafficking, uh, workers' comp, insurance fraud, tax tax fraud, etc. Um, and so we have been on the forefront of that work. Um, I appreciate the time to speak today on just some of our concerns that we have about 700 American Boulevard West. First, just in general, um, construction that is multi-unit, framed in wood, uh, seeking assistance to build either senior housing or affordable housing is a segment of our industry where we see frequent problems with misclassification and other issues. Uh, thus, we, we will closely monitor this site and we closely monitor sites like this. This is a kind of a red flag just segment of our industry. Uh, second, uh, the general contractor for the site is expected to be Eagle Building Company. There are several public documents available, which I, I know y'all should have in your inbox, indicating concerns with the primary subs and lower tiered subs that have been used by Eagle Building Company. Just to highlight a few examples, um, most recently Nelson Lopez uh, pled guilty and was sentenced for workers' compensation insurance fraud just this last month, just this past month. Um, Nelson Lopez worked on both the Rosemary Apartments in Hugo, as well as 108 Place right here in Bloomington, um, where both, uh, both of those sites were overseen by Eagle Building Company as a general contractor. Um, also in a summons document for the 4th Judicial District uh, Court, the State of Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison versus Property Maintenance and Construction, also known as PMC, and Le Leopoldo Pimentel Jr. On page eight, uh, these sites are also listed. So uh, take a close look at that. Um, furthermore, um, just other folks, Nelson Lopez, Rangel Torres, MO, MO Framing, Castante Construction, Saul C Cesares have all worked directly underneath the supervision of Wolf, which is a subcontractor that uh, Eagle uses. Wolf regularly uses the subcontractor's absolute drywall in painting America, and we have plenty of documents, probably a, plenty of public documents we can send you on, on those folks as well. So unfortunately, although we love building things and we would love to see a lot of affordable housing built, um, currently at this point, we are in opposition to this project unless the current uh, expected general contractor, Eagle Building Company, is prepared to do business uh, differently than they have in the past. Uh, one that ensures that workers on the site are being classified properly, compensated fairly, and not in an environment that has a potential risk of labor exploitation. We strongly urge the city council to keep this in mind, not only on this project, but as you move forward with all construction uh, in this city, to please ask the tough questions. Wherever there's public assistance or variances asked for, uh, please keep in mind default language, also known as clawback language, um, and uh, uh, 
make sure that, you know, we'd ask that you really ask what are the values around construction in the city and really start to seriously have that conversation and uh, put that uh, into, into code if possible. Um, I appreciate your time this evening, and, and like I said, we ask that you take a look at the documents. I have a couple other colleagues here that would also like to speak. I do want to say that I am available for any follow-up questions. I think, you know, you know, just call my cell phone. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Good evening and welcome. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bussey. Council members, uh, my name is Dan McConnell. I'm the business manager of the Minneapolis Building and Construction Trades Council. Uh, concerns are very similar to what uh, Ms. Nelson just shared. Um, I, you know, I represent 17,000 construction workers in the western metro area, 25 affiliated local unions. Uh, two of them are here tonight. Um, over the last several years, I've been spending a lot of time on wage theft and labor trafficking concerns on construction projects. Uh, we've really seen it grow from you know, people just, you know, obviously we're a union, right? We don't like to see non-union projects, right? And it's grown beyond just a simple union, non-union is issue, right? The, the legitimate non-union contractors have really gone away to a large extent in this in this marketplace. Um, where we're seeing this, uh, this kind of labor trafficking uh, and really unconscionable behavior on these projects and how they're done. Uh, so this developer, we've had a really good relationship over the years with uh, the developer. Uh, we worked on them most recently on a project, uh, the old Broadway Pizza. Very successful project. We'd love to work with them again. We've taught, had conversations with them about this project, and they've indicated that they, as uh, as Kim Ms. Nelson indicated, they're going to thinking about using Eagle on this project, which we raised concerns with them about the project. And because this is our one chance to get it in the public, you know, we're here tonight, right? So uh, we're hopeful that we can work things out, but I do want to make sure that uh, we put the put the marker down, I guess. Um, so as, as Ms. Nelson again mentioned, we sent you several documents uh, outlining the concerns we're aware of. Um, I think the most uh, concerning one I saw was Umberto Rangel Torres, who uh, went to police, uh, investigated in 2019. He's currently certain serving. 12-year sentence in federal prison for sex trafficking uh, related to one of the projects that uh, uh, he worked on that Eagle, Eagle Builders was part of. Uh, we were hugely supportive of building affordable housing. As I mentioned, we did a, a previous project with the developer. Our pension funds invested in that project. We'd love to have an opportunity here, um, be that as may, you know, we don't want to see illicit behavior on these projects, right? That's our job to advocate for workers. We don't want to see it be a false choice between a building affordable housing and treating workers well. We think that's not a, a fair comparison to make. Uh, and we just ask if there's public financing or public leverage you can pull on this. I think you own the property, right? So you should have plenty of ability to set conditions over the sale of the property. And we just ask you to ensure that the project is something we can all be proud of. And that's my comments, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Belsi and uh, Council members. My name is Octavio Chon Bustamante. I work as an organizer for La Una, Labor's International Union in North America. Uh, La Una is a labor organization that seeks to advance the welfare of union and non-union construction workers in Minnesota. Our members do all type of construction from demolition to concrete, uh, placement to asbestos removal. Our membership is diverse, and we have members and retirees who live right here in Bloomington. Also, we represent almost 14,000 members statewide. I understand that Schaefer Richardson is proposing a senior housing development that will be located at 700 American Boulevard. It is also my understanding that this development will utilize low-income housing tax credits and tax exempt funds to ensure, to ensure affordability. Like I mentioned in my introduction, my job is to seek to advance the welfare of union and non-union construction workers. One of the ways that I do that is by going to non-union job sites to empower workers to speak up if they are going through issues like discrimination, worker misclassification, or intimidation, which is something that happens a lot and jobs that are being done by immigrant workers. 
A couple of years ago, uh, Schaefer Richardson developed a multifamily project in Weber, Weber Lake, where I live. One of the subcontractors working on the project was uh, environmental stoneworks. I believe that, they, that there could be 100 or more mason and laborers and environmental stoneworks projects who have been misclassified as independent contractors and who have been denied overtime, pay, unemployment insurance, and other benefits that contractors are required to provide to their employees. These workers talk to me about having to pay for their own liability and working compensation insurance and paying higher taxes rates because they have been misclassified. As the developer of the project, Schaefer Richardson, has the responsibility to, to know who is working on the projects and to make sure that works are being treated fairly. Preventing this type of uh, exploitative, uh, preventing this type of uh, exploitative activities is everyone's responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility. Uh, it's you guys' responsi responsibilities is everyone. That's why it's important to be proactive and having cities policies that are going to protect workers. Because at the end of the day, I think that what everybody, everybody wants to do is to work and go home and to enjoy life. But, but when you are an immigrant, especially an immigrant without uh, documents, it is hard to speak up and contractors take advantage of that situation. I asked the city of Bloomington to protect workers by passing policies that will do so and ask the developer to please, please, please make sure that every worker on your side is going to be treated treated with dignity and respect. I would like to share a report on, on affordable housing where I mentioned some of our concerns about some of, some of these projects that are done by immigrant workers, who a lot of times are being taken advantage of or are being exploited. It also give more details on the company that Schaefer Richardson has worked with before uh, that was describing to you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Sleeve here or? Uh, if you could hand them to Mr. Brillert. Mr. Sable, that'd be perfect. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Mr. Sable, I believe we had someone on the line, and I believe they may have dropped off. Or is anybody back on the line now? Um, to speak? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. They were on, and then they have dropped off, so no one else is on the line. Very good. Last call for anybody here in the council chambers? Very good. Thank you for your comments this evening. Council, seeing no one coming forward, knowing on the, no one on the line, I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.4. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to close the public hearing on item 4.4. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0, closing the public hearing. So, Council, questions, comments on this? Uh, I think the, the issues that were brought forward are important and, and issues that we need to to take seriously and, and concentrate on, um, we, you know, we always, we ha always have the conversation in any public bidding situation where it's th the bid goes to the lowest responsible bidder, right? And and the lowest we can all agree on it's the dollars and cents, but I think it's incumbent on public bodies like this and other public bodies to really define and hone in on that notion of responsible. And uh, this may be a case of this. And um, I'm not sure where we are within the. Um, uh, the process here within the situation, I would turn to our city attorney and ask, in terms of the, the final development plan and any development agreement, is there a specific language or is there specific work we can do within that to uh, to ensure that we avoid the uh, the issues that we've heard this evening? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor members. Um, we've actually had this on our radar a bit uh, increasingly within the last couple of months. Uh, generally speaking, you know, uh, employment conditions on construction sites, we've become increasingly aware of that statewide and also uh, within the region. So our uh, folks in legal, uh, specifically in the compliance division, have been talking with staff down in community development to look at our development agreements and um, review some possible language that can be added to strengthen uh, the type of uh, requirements that we compel the developers to uh, comply with. So uh, if you're looking for some direction, I think it would be helpful for you to suggest that staff prepare an agreement with the developer that requires the prime contractor and its subs to follow the employment laws that were specifically highlighted during public comment, and then we can put together some language to try and accomplish that. Um, I, 
based on what I've the research that I've done, I believe that that sub that that subsequent agreement would likely come before um, the body for for approval, probably in the first or second quarter of 2024. So if you're thinking about sort of when the timing on that is, that's what I'm guessing it is. Does that make sense to staff? They're seeing they're nodding heads. So we can start putting that together. We've already done some work on it, um, but uh, unfortunately, Bloomington is not unique in in um, being told about some of these concerns on construction sites. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mandershed. Uh, basically, what you just outlined there, I think, as I look down the table here, I don't see any heads shaking. I see everyone nodding. I think it makes a perfect sense, and I think we, we need to do everything that we can. We've got to require that the developer take every action to ensure that the workers at the 700 American Boulevard West project are treated with dignity and respect. And I think we need to, uh, we need to codify that as best we can Codify is probably the incorrect verb, but I mean to, to put that into uh, the, our development agreements and formalize that so that uh, it's understood very clearly what our expectations are as the city of Bloomington. Yes, Mayor members, uh, certainly we can put something in a development agreement in this particular instance. Uh, if the council is looking to put something in in the code, um, that's certainly something that you could direct us to take, um, take on as well. Um, we're putting together work plans right now, so just let us know. <laughs> I, I think in the development agreement, I think it's a no-brainer. I think that's an absolute. And uh, council, do we want do we want staff to look at it in terms of maybe codify? Was the correct verb there? Uh, so to maybe to codify this in in the best way possible for what we're trying to do. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge, something to add? I was just going to reaffirm, Mr. Mayor, that if uh, council wants us to, we can spend some staff effort uh, developing what that language might look like uh, for ordinance consideration by the council. Thank you. Councilmember Carter, then Councilmember Loman, then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember um, Carter. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you for uh, putting that forth as a proposal to move forward. I am definitely in support. I'm wondering in the specific development agreement that we're talking about um, for this project, would that include clawback language? So if something were to happen and they weren't to hold up their end of the agreement, um, considering how much uh, public benefit is going into this project, I mean, is that something we could put into the contract? Ms. Mandershain? Uh, Mayor members, we can certainly look at that. Uh, I'm, I'm not able to speak specifically on, on the language at this point. We haven't drafted any of it yet. Um, but we can certainly keep that into consideration. And if we can find a way to include it, we, we certainly will. Uh, Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so my question is, um, uh, thank you, Councilmember Carter, for what you asked. That <laughs> informs me in terms of what I want to ask in terms of timing, um, I know in terms of wage theft and uh, the other issues that were raised uh, this evening. Um, is it possible to bring back uh, an ordinance uh, prior uh, to us um, uh, with regard to wage theft and the other issues that were raised here prior to uh, uh, finally uh, either passing or, or moving this forward? Is that is that too tight of a timeline? Is there a way to delay this to be sure that that, that is done first and then have this apply to that? Spanish hand? Uh, Mayor members, uh, I certainly say generally speaking, an ordinance takes around 90 days from start to finish um, when we don't have to go through um, planning commission. So this would probably not be a planning commission item. It probably would not be in those chapters. That said, uh, certainly uh, the planning commission might have some interest in hearing it, um, and we would want to honor that request if they want to make a recommendation. Um, generally speaking, uh, I believe that we, I don't know what the timing is on the specifics of when the development agreement is expected. April? Okay, so theoretically, I think it's possible. Um, and we could look at how quickly we could turn something like that around. Uh, setting up the compliance on the back end of it would be a bigger endeavor um, and uh, creating the enforcement mechanism for that. Uh, I saw the hand raise in the audience. I don't know if you want to. Councilmember. Loman, you're okay with uh, was your question? Yeah, and let me just ask one uh, follow up to directly to that that question. And we are the uh, we in, in effect are putting this forward, so we could delay this, right? Or is there or are we on a 
on a uh, timeline with with this since we have a developer selected that we've got to comply with with that time Mr. frame. Brugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. What's being asked of tonight, uh, Council Members, is a land use action. It's not necessarily uh, related to the specific policy issue that we're discussing. Um, the time for consideration of what language would be appropriate is at the time that we are considering a development agreement um, with with the owner and developer of the property. So that would be April, and uh, I, and I would, as we're working on the land use approval this evening, I, I think that we we can talk land use approval. I think the policy issue that we're talking about here, uh, it's important. I would hate to rush into it. I would make sure I would want to make sure that we do it correctly. Uh, I would. I would defer to staff as we look and see whether or not April is the appropriate amount of time. They say 30 days. I mean, that's 120 days. But then you've got, it's never easy, right? I mean, it's always, they'll be back and forth. So uh, I think my recommendation tonight to move forward with what we've got tonight to direct staff to, um, to begin to write up the final uh, development agreement with specific language that we talked about and then see how the work progresses in terms of actually putting this within within city code that makes sense and mr mayor if, if i may also the the timing the the 90 days that uh, the city attorney talked about uh we do have examples in other municipalities that we can look to in terms of ordinance language uh the staff is already familiar with some of that um, I think part of it depends on what the direction from the council is in terms of uh, the level of engagement that you wish to have as we develop this ordinance um, consideration. And uh, again, making sure that we're true to our, our uh, uh, intent to have community engagement, making sure we get a clear expectation from council on what the promise is to the community for what amount of input will be sought and how we're going to use that input in the process. Um, so we may want to take longer than the 90 days and I think we still can effectively include language in a development agreement if council wants to do that. We just won't have maybe some of the back end things that the city attorney talked about in terms of the compliance steps in place for it. Um, but if we're running those processes on a dual track, we can certainly figure out the one at the same time we're doing the other. Does that make sense, Council Member? Yeah, and I'll wait till we have a comment period. Yeah. Council Member D'Alessandro? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, two uh, questions. Um, and, and one is related to what Mr. Verbrugge just said. I was going to I was going to ask. It, it seems like we can cover ourselves uh, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish here with this specific project through that development agreement, which gives us more time to then develop the ordinance. So I understand that correctly. Um, the the other area of, of opportunity, I think we're already working on. And so I wanted to throw this out there as a, a question to the staff. Are we already looking at these kinds of 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 workplace conditions uh, in the review we're doing around our procurement equity projects anyway. Um, my understanding is that we do have some work being done with procurement in places like that around um, around equity, you know, in suppliers and all that kind of stuff. This feels very much like a thing that you could add into that fairly quick, fairly easily to help to help um, um, drive, you know, workers accommodation workers rights into that that work um i don't know if that was something that was thought of or whether or not um we could consider that but i know that's actively being worked at the moment and it feels like it might this might slot in very well to that which would maybe make the overall work plan not it doesn't get a lot bigger it just gets more focused in that particular area as part of that work is that an option for us? Mr. Verbrugge? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Member, staff is happy to follow up with the Council Member uh, and provide additional information, but for the purpose of the record related to the public hearing for the specific action tonight, it's not necessarily germane to the property or the action, so right. I'd rather not have that be part of the record, but we'll follow up with you and provide additional information. Okay, sure. Makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> Council Member Nelson? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is probably just my own... Um, problem here but can I understand the uh, land part of this the rezoning of it but aren't we approving the final plans isn't that part of the action we're taking we're, we're approving the final development plans not the final development agreement 
Okay. There's a distinction with very little difference, but there. Well, <laughs> and, and, and actually, that, mis- but that's my yeah. problem. I mean, Mr. Mr. Mayor and Council members, plan. it is it is uh, a little it is an important difference in that the the you know the approval for what the plan is going to be will be set. Uh, if the developer were not seeking assistance from the city uh, to move the project forward, the project could move ahead. We know that's not the case because of uh, the pro forma that's been presented and, and just the, uh, the parameters of the, of the deal that they're looking at. So they will have entitlements for this development for X period of time. Um, but if they don't come forward uh, seeking financial assistance, uh, the project either won't go forward or it will at a time that the council is satisfied that other things have been said, have been taken care of. Okay. Um, the second question I have, um, given the change in the number of units, a reduction by almost 25%, a reduction in the commercial space by 75%, are any of the other RFPs still viable? Mr. Bruy? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't think that we can. Uh, I don't think that we can answer that because we haven't done the work necessary to understand market conditions or uh, economies associated with what those proposals were, uh, having dismissed them uh, when we made the determination to work with Schaefer Richardson. Okay. Council, additional questions. Discussion on this. Thoughts? Councilmember Council Member Nelson, and I know Councilmember Lohman wanted it as well. Councilmember Nelson? Councilmember Lohman, I mean. Don't mind me switching it. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Councilmember Nelson had, had raised uh, uh, this idea of that 25% reduction, you know, from the RFP. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, given... Uh, you know what we we talked about, Mayor, with regard to you know uh, you know trying to do affordable housing and you know and, and in the in the units in which that we we get here, this is an area where we really do need a lot of assistance. You know, I think by my count here, looks like we lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 22 units um, in that process. You know, with regard to with regard to parking, and so I am wondering uh, if it makes some sense to kind of uh, go back to this and see if there's a way that we can kind of rectify that and get us closer to that, 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 you know, those 22 that were lost, uh, either with regard to, you know, what, um, you know, what staff has brought forward. And, uh, uh, so that's just, you know, my, my, my initial thinking as I, as I look at these, uh, these pieces and then, you know, uh, you know, certainly, and I want to, I want to just be really clear that, uh, uh, the ordinance piece, um, I should leave that, uh, that piece till the end of the uh, end of the meeting, because I, I know that that is technically not a part of what we're discussing here. So I want to be extremely careful um, about that. Um, you know, and I you know I have heard about these things that are here, and I know that we you know we're kind of I'm kind of getting ahead of ourselves here, but I, I do have concerns um, um, about um, you know you know given our our mission statements and our our strategic priorities and that type of thing that you know these fall within that, and I'm. I'm reluctant, uh, you know, given the stances that we've taken, you know, with our strategic priorities. And I know that this is at that last minute. I'm kind of, in a sense, in a trick bag because, you know, we have something before us, Mayor. <laughs> and, uh, you know, how do we, you know, write standards for something, um, you know, that we haven't done in the past? And so I, I'm, I'm afraid that, you know, we haven't already done that. So I'm kind of in a – I'm trying to figure out a way to get out of this out of this mess. So that's, that's what I'm looking to you, Mayor. Uh, because uh, I, I really do want to stay true to, you know, you know what the community and, and all of us came together uh, to, to develop those, that mission statement. And uh, when it comes to equity and inclusion, um, I've got some grave concerns if we go down this route just as it's written today um, without seeing what is uh, what's uh, put together uh, completely, uh, without having that final uh, – uh, without having what we're not discussing today, that, that final, uh, final direction. So – in terms of having some some draft language, which is impossible to have right now, and I know that's above and beyond mm-hmm. the scope of of today. You understand what I'm saying? I, I do indeed. It's a trick bag. So, yep. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I understand uh, exactly where you're coming from, uh, Council Member Lohman. 
I would suggest if the council is not satisfied with the project that's being presented that you uh, uh, deny it and uh, tell us to go back out to the market. What the applicant has presented is what the applicant feels is uh, market viable uh, given the financial conditions that exist today. I'd also uh, remind the council that I, I think this is meeting an important uh, market niche in our community and that all 100 or all of the units are affordable and it's for senior apartments. We uh, have heard from the community that there is a need within the community for affordable senior living and this project would be meeting uh, that expressed need uh, from the community. So I, I think it is consistent with our strategic plan. Uh, if I had my druthers, um, frankly, we'd have uh, a, a different project just because that the, the um, it's not a it's not in any way a um, uh, characterization of Schaefer Richardson or the proposal that they've made it's a highly visible intersection uh, and if there were a better project out there I think we probably would have discovered it um, because we've been trying to develop this property for uh, 10 years now right and so uh, it, the, the market conditions are such that it's a very um, difficult project to bring forward. Um, and I think that Schaefer Richardson has found the, the best way to do that. Uh, Council Member Nelson, are you looking to get back in? And then Council Member Martin, Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, actually, I appreciate those comments, um, City Manager. Um, what I heard from Schaefer Richardson representative was that they thought they could get more units and um, but for some things that we're requiring as a city. And so I'm wondering if it, it makes sense to explore that with more time. I, you know, I do feel a little uncomfortable approving something that's so different than what the RFP was when there were other people in the marketplace that may have been able to do something and meet more of our goals. Um, and so I kind of have that dual thing that I'm hearing from the, the project coordinator company that they could do more. And I have other RFPs that say that they could do more as well. And would it make any sense to spend a little bit more time working on them while simultaneously addressing the concerns that were raised, making sure that obviously everyone is treated and classified correctly? That just, in my mind, makes absolute sense. I mean, people should follow the law. I don't know why this is a big, huge question. And it should be pretty straightforward to everybody that they do that. I totally recognize that people don't do that. Um, and, and they should be held to account for that. So um, those are my comments. I'm just wondering if a little bit more time to see if we can get more units, get some of those units back, see what the concerns, see what their ideas are in terms of doing that or, and or see if there's one of the other ones that makes more sense at this point, given the changes in the shift in this project. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think they've done good hard work as a, as a city manager has, has mentioned, and it's a tough, it's a tough place. It's a, a tough place to develop and they got a plan and that's what's before us. And, you know, ideally, you know, let's not like perfect get in the way of good. So Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members, council member Nelson. I think it's, uh, uh, uh comments fully understood. Um, we had the same con conversation with the council and the port in a joint meeting on July 31st about the reduction in the scope of the project and uh, staff were directed to move forward uh, with that reduction based on that conversation. And so if, if we're going to go back uh, again and change that decision from July 31st, uh, we'd probably need pretty clear direction about what it is that we're trying to accomplish at that point. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, uh, I appreciate Councilmember Nelson uh, alluding to not making the perfect the enemy of the good, but I guess coming at it from the, the perspective of, yes, it's not 100% of what we were ideally hoping for, but it is an iterative opportunity on the policies that are holding the project back from achieving that. Um, and obviously not kind of within the scope of, of this conversation, but longer term, it feels like an opportunity to inform, say, the next iteration of the Opportunity Housing Ordinance, the larger conversation about these code requirements. So it might, might not get to that, that dream destination with this specific project. We now have stakeholders in the room that could tell you exactly what the next project would need in order to get you across that finish line. So, And then at that point, it's in a comprehensive framework uh, as opposed to the specific constraints of this one lot, this one project, the economics of this. So. 
Councilmember D'Alessandro. Just my comments on this. I think that um, I think number one, if we have if we have the ability to to insert into our explicit development agreement on here, um, and it sounds like based on the commentary we got in, in public comment period that. Um, uh, Schaefer Richardson is a good company that will do the right thing here, so I'm not concerned about that in, as far as I can tell, um, assuming um, we are able to put in place the language. Um, uh, it sounds like everybody is excited to work with them and have them build something here in Bloomington, so um, let's hope that that's true. Um, the The comment I would make is um, I don't I – don't, knowing that we already knew that these reductions were happening and we approved them in July. I don't want to open that can of worms again myself. Um, not to mostly because I am a huge fan of moving fast, generally speaking. And I am concerned that any delay we would impart on this for want of an, you know, 10 more units or whatever could result in something disastrous because of the market conditions we have volatility in the economic conditions. You know, next thing you know, it's, 50% more expensive to build everything, right? Because of some stupid thing that happened in supply chain or whatever. And, um, and so, you know, letting, making sure that we get this lockdown that we have, con, you know, concerted effort to get 120 plus units of affordable senior living into Bloomington feels like a really good thing for us to be doing. Um, and so I, 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 I like, the idea that we can hold the developer to account in accordance with our values and in accordance with the worker requirements that we know we want to enforce. And I like the idea that we can move this project uh, forward um, with that in mind if we can get that development agreement put together. Um, and then uh, in terms of code, um, like I said, I think that um, there's opportunity for us to to look at that more uh, string, stringently, um, and with, if we're opening up the opportunity housing ordinance, if we're opening up the the work in procurement, whatever, wherever we are doing that, to to make sure we have explicit, you know, um, language around what we will and won't accept when it comes to worker th uh, wage theft, um, prevailing wage, you know, these kinds of issues that are just really important. So, um, so uh, you know, let me know if you want me to. I want to make, make the sure motion when you're ready. I want to make sure everybody's had an opportunity yeah, to speak. Uh, I just want to chime in. I, I, agree, I agree with what you, a lot of what you said, Councilmember D'Alessandro, the fact that uh, the, this body and the Port Authority did look at this over the summer and, and gave the go-ahead. I think we have to take that into account. Bodies can change their minds. I understand that. But I think we have made at least the indication that we were happy and comfortable with this moving forward as it was. I've also, uh, I think as one of two members of this council that were on the council when the Fraunshu proposal came forward low these years ago. Uh, and if I recall, I, I voted against that development saying something better will come along. We can wait and we can get something that fits our needs and our niche more perfectly. And that was a decade ago. And I, I have, uh, I'm a little bit gun shy that if we do that again, I'm worried that we're going to be looking at a blank parcel of, of ground on a on a prime spot in Bloomington for a number of years and I don't want to see that happen would I, I uh, echoing mr. Verbrugge's comments would I like something bigger and better and, and more flashy and more important on that very important uh, intersection yes I would but this is what we've got in front of us right now and this is where we are in this conversation and so um, I appreciate the comments of the council members um, but I, I do think this is worth moving forward on and um, agree with everybody's comments that the, the wage issues around this certainly need to be dealt with in, in a variety of different ways, and I think we're committed to moving forward on that. But in terms of this um, land use decision, these development agreements, personally, I'm ready to move them forward and, and approve them this evening. Councilmember Nelson? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to note that I actually was not at that part of the meeting. <laughs> so that may be first. why I'm, yeah. I'm bringing some oh, of these things be. up okay. at this point. I, I, I arrived late due to a conflict in my schedule, and I was not in that discussion. So, Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification. <clears throat> Council, any additional comments? If not, let's see where we are on this. Councilmember D'Alessandro. 
I'll move to adopt an ordinance amending the zoning. Is that the right one? Yes, the zoning map by rezoning 700 American Boulevard West from B2PD General Commercial Plan Development to RM100 PD High Density Residential Plan Development. Second. Motion by Council Members D'Alessandro, second by Council Member Mort Martin to adopt the ordinance amending the zoning map by rezoning 700 American Boulevard West from B2 to RM100. Any further council discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Council Member D'Alessandro, would you be willing to continue on? I will. Um, I'll, I'll make, if it's okay, I'll make a comment after we get to, through motion. Very good. Yes, uh, if you get the motion in the second, then we'll um, open it up for comments. Great. Yep. Um, m uh, move to approve preliminary and final development plans for a five-story, 128-unit senior apartment and 1,500 square foot of commercial space at 700 American Boulevard West, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin, to approve the pre preliminary and final development plans for the proposal at 700 American Boulevard West, subject to the conditions and the code requirements attached to the staff report. Council comments on this. Council Member D'Alessandro. I, I had a quick I had a quick comment question on the specific language here. It mentions subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Um, is it possible to amend uh, language in accordance with the, for the purposes of making note that we expect certain things in the in the development agreement or something like that? I, I think that's entirely um, it, it's entirely acceptable, and I think um, with um, I'll, I'll turn to the city attorney to tell me how to do this most efficiently. Uh, Mayor members, the the motion has been made on the final on the preliminary and final plat, or excuse me, excuse me, goodness sakes, the preliminary and final development plans um, with these very specific numbers and units counts in them, and based on the presentation and information in the staff report you could uh, give direction to staff after you vote on that PDP and um, uh, final development plan motion, directing staff to incorporate the elements that you heard in the staff discussion in a separate motion afterwards. I think it's important to keep these land use approvals clean. Um, is staff, land use staff, planning staff, yeah, I'm getting nodding heads on that. Thank you, Ms. Mandershad. So is that clear? We yes, to do we this can. and then make a second motion directing staff to very follow good. up on this. Thank uh, you. Very good. Oh, okay. Very good. That was the question. So we have a motion and a second on the table regarding the uh, preliminary and final development plans. Any further council discussion on this? Hearing none. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-1 with Council Member Nelson in the uh, in uh, opposition. Very good now, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro. Uh, as Council Member D'Alessandro said, I think we should uh, make a motion now to direct staff to, I can't remember all the words you said, Ms. Mandershide, but uh, to, to, to follow up in, in ways that we had talked about in terms of uh, the issues that were brought forward this evening. Mayor members, let me see if I can find my language. Please. For your consideration, Mayor and Please. members, uh, directing staff to prepare an agreement with Schaefer Richardson that requires the prime contractor and its subcontractors to follow the employment laws highlighted during public comment. How's that? Councilmember Carter? Um, I may suggest all subcontractors because I think there can be subcontractors of subcontractors of subcontractors, you know, and I don't want it to be just the ones that Schaefer Richardson subcontracts. I think that we need to make clear that all subcontractors on the project need to comply. So, Mayor, if I could, do you want me to restate it? If you could, please. Okay. Uh, directing staff to prepare an agreement with Schaefer Richardson that requires the prime contractor and all subcontractors to follow the employment laws highlighted during public comment. Council, are we comfortable with that direction towards staff? Very good. Uh, I would make a motion that we, uh, we we make that motion as is expressed by the city attorney. Second. Second.
You're comfortable with that, Ms. Ms. Mandershine? Oh, yes, oh very good. Okay, well, I thought I'm you, sorry. I the thought way you reacted, I thought, Matt I, thought, for, I thought, okay, very good. Um, I'm sending Matt that language. Very good, very good. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Um, I'm sorry, I moved to the second one. Was that Councilmember Carter? It was. Very good. Fine. Questions on this? Uh, Councilmember? Well, I mean, Woman? I, mean I, I can make a comment. I'm just glad we, glad we did this. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm happy that we're, uh, and I hope that when we get uh, to the, uh, our, uh, our organizational business that we can also uh, additionally in, the, in its proper place uh, move another ordinance around wage theft as well. Um, so um, happy to support this and that later on uh, this evening. Councilmember D'Alessandro. A quick uh, question of clarification. So as the motion is uh, stated at the moment, it says as as indicated in, or addressed and uh, noted in public comment, are we going to be more specific when we actually write the agreement about what those particular um, uh, employment law requirements are? That I assume so, but I wanted to double check. I'll look to Ms. Mandershine. Uh, Mayor members, yes. What I plan to do is re-listen to it, and I'm sure staff will as well, but these are the ones that I got um, during public testimony, just so you know what's in my head. Uh, misclassifications, um, conditions, sorry, I wrote that shorthand. Uh, I think work site conditions. Uh, trafficking and pay denials. Um, generically speaking in those categories, but we'll listen to the tape again and make sure we've captured everything from public testimony. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Um, two questions. Is it possible that we didn't hear every employment law that might be of interest in public hearing? And should we make it more broad to just have more? I mean, and then my second question is, or just for clarification, we're not asking Schaefer Richardson to do anything more than is already required under law we just want to ensure that we want to make sure that we have that in our agreement given the public participation but we're not asking for anything outside of what's already required of them is that accurate Ms. so Mandershine. two part mayor members correct our our standard template for development agreement already requires compliance with the law generically speaking these are employment laws that are that we're talking about here um, both federal and state um, and um, they already have to comply with all of those. What I suspect will uh, come out in the drafting uh, is some reporting requirements um, and uh, sort of a statement's evidence of compliance would be my suspicion, although obviously we haven't drafted any words yet. But all of the generic um, and specific employment laws are already required to be complied with. Uh, Councilmember Nelson, quick follow-up? Yeah, quick follow-up. Um, is it possible, and I don't know if she's interested, to get any feedback from Schaefer Richardson on this because this was not on the agenda? Is that a possibility? Yeah, and I have no idea if you want to even say anything about it or not. Okay. Um, let me get one more question from uh, uh, Councilmember Carter, and then if you if you wanted to bring something forward, we'd be happy to listen. Councilmember Carter? Um, yeah, the other thing that I heard and that um, I mentioned earlier was the clawback language, and I don't think that that is part of state law. I, you know, I think we are allowed to put that into contracts, but I don't... So, although no, that, there are employment point. laws, I don't think clawback language is, you know, part of that. And so, I, mean, I could be completely wrong, but I just think that having some kind of... Um, you know, accountability enforcement mechanism beyond reporting, right, in case something does go wrong. Um, I just think it ensures uh, ensures compliance in a much greater way. So, Mayor members, if I may, I wrote, I wrote that down, uh, Council Member Carter. The, the one reason that I'm a little hesitant to speak specifically about this, I want to take a look at the OHO and see what language is in that, because um, I suspect that there's some requirements there. And I, um, if we have it already in our code, we would rely on that. All right, uh, Ms. Anthony, um, we bundled a lot up here for you. Um, I took some notes. Very good. So. <laughs> no, uh, Mr. Mayor, Please. members of the council, I appreciate the opportunity to come back up. Uh, it's a lot, and I appreciate the effort to do the right thing, uh, which is what I'm hearing from you all tonight, is that you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing and that you're following your values, and that's the way that we operate as well. Um, for the record, uh, we uh, we agree with everything that was said tonight. It is it is our position that every employee who steps on our sites is treated fairly, is paid fairly, uh, and that our contractors are held to that standard. 
uh, before we go out and select a contractor, we talk to them specifically about that expectation. Um, the contractor that we are planning to use for the site has a compliance program. We're happy to work to, to provide information on that and make sure it's as robust as possible. But um, I just want to make the point clear that that is our expectation. It is our values that marries what you're talking about tonight. And we don't have a problem complying with, uh, with the law. That's our expectation. Um, as Mr. McConnell discussed, we work with the unions regularly. Uh, we work with AFL-CIO. They're our sponsor on actually two projects for almost two, 350 affordable units in the metro area. Uh, there is no conflict for us in that regard. Um, and uh, to your point, uh, Council Member Nelson, um, we, we will follow the law. Uh, we always endeavor to follow the law. I think that it's an important conversation tonight and we're happy to be part of the solution. I did want to mention just from a timing standpoint um, that uh, as is such with affordable housing projects, there are timelines that go along with funding. Uh, you all approved a proposal for us to pursue, pursue housing conduit bonds. If we're successful in that in January, it does start a clock. Um, I just want to make that clear uh, because I, I would hate to lose out on that opportunity for financing uh, while you're, you all are creating and debating and, and seeking public comment on a very important policy for your city. Uh, so we're happy to be, you know, to do what we can to make sure that our project is held accountable, which we expect to, to meet uh, without uh, hamstringing the project for moving forward and losing out on that important financing while the city puts together an important uh, ordinance. So any questions for me? Questions from Ms. Anthony? Well, th thank you for those comments. It, it, um, and I, I hope we didn't imply that, uh, there, that we were casting aspersions in any way on Schaefer Richardson in terms of your willingness and your, your absolute commitment to upholding the law because I don't think that was the intention. I think nope. the intention was just to make sure that, um, that, again, all workers are treated fairly, all workers are treated equally, and, and that the values of this community are upheld. So, Absolutely. Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Verbrugge? Oh, you had your microphone on. You fooled me there. Yeah, I have no additional comments. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Loman. Sorry, Mayor. Just just one question. Just a little concerned about the clawback language. Um, if we haven't done that before, and that's not something that's in law, I'm just a little bit nervous about trying to do that. That's you know why I prefer to have something like that placed in a in, a, in an ordinance that we work through. Um, um, I'm just concerned about that may put the city in an in a, in a adverse position. If I'm wrong with that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to support that, but I'm concerned about uh, adding that. Well, Council Member, I think that's why uh, Ms. Mandershad said that we're going to take a look at it and see how it applies to the OHO and, and other work that we're doing. And uh, if, if it makes sense and it fits, yes. If not, we could certainly include it in, in other ordinance possibilities, or uh, I'm sure our legal staff will look at different ways that we could skin that cat. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to yeah, just have that on the record as a, if, if I support this, uh, and I do plan on supporting it, that uh, that's my, my one concern with, uh, with that piece. So Very good. All right. Are we all good? We, I think we have the motion and the we second on the table. We have a motion and the second right? on the table. I'm, I'm just making sure everybody has chimed in. All right. I, one final thing. Except I'm, for this is going to come back. I know it's going to come back to it's going to come back to council for approval, right? We're the actual about, development about agreement. Months out from that, yes. And not the not the ordinance, but the development agreement itself. Yes. So both of those things, but Correct. they're not. They're now parallelized. They're not on the same timeline. Correct. We're not going to impact uh, the timeline that was of concern to. Uh, Correct. Schaefer Richardson. Okay, Correct. great. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Right. Thank you. Just Thank you. Care no further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thanks much for the conversation, and thanks to all for the conversation. It was an important one to have, and I'm glad we finally, we, we've kind of danced around this a bit in the past, and, and I'm glad we finally did have this conversation. I think it was on the agenda for next year at some point, but I'm glad we got to it this year and, and got it under underway. And thanks, Ms. Manderscheid and Mr. Verbrugge, for your input on this. I think it's very helpful when uh, you're able to chime in and, and give us some direction and keep us out of trouble, basically. So I appreciate that as well. Very good. Thank you all. We will move on to our final public hearing of the evening. 
This is our public hearing item 4.5 on our miscellaneous issues for ordinances 2023. This is a yearly toe tapper for everybody. This is uh, um, when we, we, we do this annually uh, just to clean up some of our ordinances and so on. And uh, Mallory Rickdahl, I don't know that we have seen you in front of the council before. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, there was the scrambling egg ordinance in July, but oh, okay. But yes, I'm sorry. it's my good to see you all again. My memory's not wonderful what it used time to be, of year. Welcome back. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, and happy miscellaneous season to you all. Um, so yeah, uh, miscellaneous season is upon us, and um, yeah. So I think um, Council Member Moa. You're the, the new face in the crowd this year. Uh, hello, nice to meet you. Um, so we prepare ordinances and we bundle them together um, because usually uh, they don't on their own merit the time and overhead uh, processes of, of writing a report and going through planning commission. So we bring them together. And, um, and so we have uh, 18 amendment or ordinance proposals for you today. So this year, uh, we developed a new process for miscellaneous, um, which uh, is comprised of, of four sort of, um, of, of uh, four tenants, which is uh, we created one avenue where um, pr proposals that were suggested from the community development department and the planning division had one one route to go, which is our SharePoint site. Um, but because of that, um, th it used to come from a lot of different places, which then created communication issues. We um, opened the window. So March through September, we had the entire time open so that if anyone saw anything in our code that looked like a typo or something that was unclear or caused an enforcement issue, that they could bring it and report it directly to us. Um, secondly, we created a continual peer review process. And what this looked like was quarterly um, at our all staff meeting in the planning division, we would rank each of the proposed ordinances based on four different criteria. The most important being, does this fit the scope of what is required of a miscellaneous issue, which is uh, an issue that does not of its own get a public hearing. Um, so that's usually the, the first priority prioritization. Um, we also looked at impact, we looked at difficulty, and um, we looked at, um, what was the other one? Now it's slipping my mind. Um, uh, impact, impact, uh, complexity. That was the other one. And so as as far as complexity and difficulty, those things in its of their own did not contribute to the prioritization criteria, though in a year that we have maybe 40 proposals for miscellaneous issues, it could be used to um, prioritize which ones would be most important for that year's process. Um, I also want to say that um, we did look at impact as, a, um, as evidence for is this a project that might require the rapid racial equity impact analysis. Um, and so this year, because we did some data gathering through our peer review process, um, none of our projects ranked above a four, which then requires that rapid racial equity impact analysis. We did have some that ranked in the threes. And so that was kind of an area where we had to work with our colleagues in uh, the Office of Racial Equity and Inclusion. And we also asked Planning Commission, is this something that warrants a, r a rapid racial equity impact analysis? And the verdict coming back from our partners and from Planning Commission was that there wasn't, um, which is great because that means that we are totally hitting the mark on what is a miscellaneous issue. So um, that is our process, a little background on our process this year. Um, here's our, our timeline. We're here in December. Um, and so this has, um, we've been open since uh, March and uh, once we uh, put in place the new process and um, here we are, happy December. There it is, there's the animation you all know and love. Okay, so um, we have cleanup items that are on the left-hand side of the table, um, and those are items A through I, and I will go through those rather quickly this evening. And then we have items J through R, which are uh, more substantive, um, and those are the items that I will spend a little more time covering today. But um, I have, we can always go back if there's any questions. 
Okay, so getting started with the ordinances themselves, we have Ordinance A, which is um, a blank subsection as it exists. This happened in 2006 when the ordinance language was written, and so you see that on line L, uh, it has a subsection of one and those two were on the same line, which then created, oops, then created a, uh, a gap. And so um, our plan or our proposal is to close this gap by moving the uh, language up a line. Okay, second is type two home business. Um, so the notes on this one is that um, a, a couple of years ago, there was an amendment to change the final decision maker to, uh, for, uh, to planning commission for a CUP, um, but this standard was missed. And so we suggest um, just striking the approved by city council because through the normal conditional use permit process is approved by the planning commission. Okay, uh, you may notice this one from last year. <laughs> this is our site width diagram. We had to revise it again. As you can see, the site width measurement lines are not uh, curvilinear as they are shown in the diagram that we approved last year. They are straight across, which is an important distinct a distinction. So we um, have updated the site width diagram to show that the lines are straight and matching our um, definition of how site width measurement lines are drawn and measured. Um, item D uh, is not super exciting, um, but this is, uh, there is an incorrect link. Um, so chapter 21 um, is actually for recreational vehicle standards um, instead of what is intended to reflect, which is to say single family dwelling standards. So an important distinction. Um, so item E, um, so height also does play into the um, setbacks. Um, if a structure is over a certain height, then the setback is actually larger, but this is confusing the, the way that it is written in code. So our suggestion is to move the um, point eight um, underneath the table under an asterisk that says that two family dwelling structures must meet the height limits of the city code and then it provides the link to the code just for clarity. Okay, perimeter fencing. Um, so this one, um, the perimeter fencing um, accidentally lists our drive-through standards instead of what is intended, what it is intended to show, which is our fence standards. So we are proposing to update that. Uh, so that does not exist anymore. Um, okay, this is a good one. Um, this is uh, section 21-50201C, process and fees. We no longer have an RV permit denial, so we would like to remove that from the table. Okay, process H. Um, last year, a miscellaneous issue sought to replace information in our tables as in terms of fees, processes and fees, um, and the fees now exist in Appendix A. However, we missed one, um, and so we would like to change the um, purpose statement um, to direct the reader to Appendix A, um, both under subpoint A and then within the table um, or above the table for um, sub section C. Okay, temporary borings. Okay, so this one comes to us from our environmental health colleagues. A new Minnesota state statute moved the definition of a temporary boring from where it was and then replaced it with the definition of an environmental well, which by definition no longer includes wells that are sealed within 72 hours. Um, because uh, our environmental health colleague says that removing temporary borings from state code standards will align with the statutory definition change required by the new Minnesota state law. Okay, slide 15. Um, so this, this is we're getting into the more substantive ones. Um, so we're really turning up the heat here. Uh, the R3 structure standards do not have a provision that detached accessory structures can be closer to the rear property line than 30 feet, which is allowed. And you can see here on the screen um, in R4, which is directly below the table. Oop, sorry about that. 
And, um, and so we would like uh, to be consistent with that. Um, so the appropriate language is um, that, it, that the, the requirement is 30 feet, but 10 feet is allowed for garages and accessory buildings that are not connected to the sanitary sewer, which is the example that is directly below it. For item K, the farmer's market definition, um, our farmer's market, uh, which is a use in our use table, does not currently have a definition in uh, 1903. So we would like to add the definition of a farmer's market, and we would like it to match the Chapter 14 definition, which exists in Section 14601. Um, the application form, um, so the strict adherence for the procedure that we require property owners to complete a specified application form for the administration of final site and building plans, preliminary development plans, final development plans, conditional use permits, and master sign plans does present inefficiencies without any additional value. So we propose that a letter um, granting permission for the administration of these processes is sufficient to ensure that the purpose and the intent of this requirement without needing to sign a very specific form as it is currently stated. Okay. Um, Non-conforming triggers, oh, this one was my idea. Um, code uh, currently dictates that non-conforming site characteristics shall be brought into conformity if 25% of an, if there's 25% of an increase in floor area that has occurred. In the past, this has been interpreted as cumulative, but is not explicitly stated in code. So we propose within this uh, amendment is that we specify that the that this is cumulative of the floor area after the date which this proposed ordinance, if approved, is published and which would be prospectively December 28th. Um, for ADU location, um, code does not currently dictate that accessory dwelling units are subject to the standard that prohibits their location between the principal structure and the street. Accessory structures that are not ADUs may not do this. Um, so we propose that we change the ADU uh, standards to um, indicate that such buildings may not exist when they are placed between, between the principal structure and the street. Displays of merchandise. Okay, so um, for displays of merchandise, we did two different um, small code changes. One is in 1903, um, and then to include installations that uh, are equipment of personal convenience like Amazon lockers or UPS drop boxes. Um, and we also updated the exterior storage standards in chapter 21 to, re to make sure that such installations um, do not impact uh, vehicle access lanes, and also we want to prohibit installations which are not incidental to the primary use of the property. The fence standards, um, so this, um, this one is in relation to the updates to the single and two family standards, um, specifically the elimination of the prevailing front setback in the R1 zoning district. So because of that, this shifted how this um, code is interpreted. Um, so the way that it has done so though, means that you can effectively build an eight foot full opacity opacity fence in a residential area at a 30-foot setback. Um, we felt that this does not support the purpose and intent of the fence code, which is to say that we should allow for fences to allow for privacy, but in general, we would like to maintain an open design along streets and to limit sight line obstructions. So we propose that um, residential fences may rise to a height of eight feet if it meets more the standards of what they existed before the prevailing setback was removed, which is um, such fences um, must either meet the 65 foot setback, um, uh, which was the maximum, which was required under set prevailing setback rules, and the fences should be located uh, within the side or rear yards, uh, which are not abutting, abutting a street, much meet must meet the principal structure setback. So you can't have a fence between the structure 
and the side yard setback that's eight foot in full opacity. Okay. Um, slide 22, current code does not indicate that uh, vehicle repair major and vehicle repair minor as a use types are intended to take place within the repair facility. And so this omission of this requirement may, may implicitly allow industrial activities to take place in the parking lot or in areas not intended for this use. So we added the words inside a building to the definition of both vehicle repair major and vehicle repair minor. Okay, so um, getting to the end here. Uh, window coverings uh, requirements are different in the HXR district than they are in any other comparable zoning districts. Specifically, there's no prohibition on film in HXR and the method to establish percentage calculations is not consistent. So we would like to amend um, our window covering requirements for the HX HXR district to match the comparable zoning district. And so staff recommends approval using the following motions. We have two different motions. We have items A through I, which are those um, quick cleanup items. And then we have J through R, which are those um, somewhat more substantive than quick cleanup items. And then we also have a um, summary of publication as well. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Council questions? Councilmember D'Alessandro, and then Councilmember Lohman. All right, let's go to N first. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Nice to see you, Molly. Um, my, uh, my question is, why do we, like, I, I, I mean, it feels somewhat arbitrary to, 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 to make a decision like this. So let me give you an example. So we, we have lots in in Bloomington uh, today that have uh, that have a very large front yard area. I, I don't given given the what we were trying we are trying to accomplish with ADUs and infill and all this other stuff. This just seems like a thing we are doing and that we may not want to do. Um, I, I don't think I don't think council asked for it. I guess is my first question. My second question is, do do we as a group? think that we shouldn't have a, if I wanted to put a small cottage in the front of my in front of my building like why wouldn't that be okay I just I, I'm confused I have to be honest about like where this came from because it doesn't feel like a cleanup item it feels like an arbitrary decision being made and we're supposed to go ahead and just accept it so uh, I'll start with N I have P and R as well but uh, we can have a discussion on N if you'd like Mr. Mayor I don't know how to proceed I just I'd, well let, let's uh, let's talk but I I don't know that I'm reading this the same way that you are. Could you perhaps summarize what N would do once again for us, please? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so N is as effectively applying for a detached ADU is applying the same standards of any other accessory structure um, to the ADU. So when the ADU ordinance was passed, I believe that was now in, in 2021, um, it didn't include that. So as it exists right now, you could put an ADU structure between your house and the street, which um, I know that there are um, a lot of opinions about what should be placed where um, in the planning division. And so uh, the question as to why I would like to defer to planning manager, sure. Mark Agard. Mr. Mark Agard, are you with us? Uh, Mr. Mayor, unfortunately, he is not. Oh, he's not. Okay. Um, um, so, for the, if I may, Mr. Mayor, for the explicit purposes of this, if what if what we're doing is we're taking the standard that we have for any other accessory unit that could be a garage, that could be, um, um, I don't know, a shed or whatever, and we're saying, hey, for everything else, you can't put that between the main house and the street. We're saying the same thing for accessory dwelling units, except that it's not the same thing because we're trying to get people to have places to live. And it doesn't, that's not the same thing as like, I want to put my third car there or I want to put my lawnmower there. Um, and so I, I, maybe I'm, 
anyway, it, does, it probably, if, if we want to have a debate on it, we can. It just feels like a little bit, um, I don't know that I would treat an accessory dwelling unit as the same as any other accessory unit, I think is what I'm saying. It feels like a different use and it feels like something we are actively trying to encourage people to build. And so artificially limiting that, I don't know, just, just for the sake of conformance doesn't necessarily mean make sense to me, I guess is my point. I understood. Um, Mr. Markegaard, do you have uh, rationale be, behind this and we can talk about it then? Yes, uh, Mayor Bosi, Council Member D'Alessandro, thank you. Um, the cleanup aspect of this is that there is other language in the code that says that accessory dwelling units are accessory structures. And then a section that says accessory structures are not allowed between uh, the building and the street. However, uh, that language was not in the ADU section. So there was some confusion uh, that people looking at that ADU section may not be aware of that standard. Mm -hmm. However, if the council uh, would prefer a situation where ADUs, unlike sheds, uh, or gazebos or such uh, could be allowed in the front yard between a principal building and the street. Uh, we could certainly do that. We would have to change the language in a few other spots, but we could certainly do that. I, I guess my question, as I'm looking at what you have boxed there, is that what we're talking about here? I mean, we're talking about the location, maybe not be attached to, detached from, or internal. Accessory dwelling units are not permitted in conjunction with. It doesn't say where... You know, it doesn't say backyard, front yard in any of that. That's the language that's missing, Mr. Mayor. That's what they're proposing to add. Ah, uh, now I understand. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, from from that standpoint, I mean, the consistency that we're looking at here, uh, I mean, you don't, I, I can envision a, a way, I can envision an instance where uh, an accessory dwelling unit in the front yard then leads to a gazebo or a garden shed or, an, or, or a garage in the front yard, just for... If, if it's good enough for a, uh, an accessory dwelling unit, why can't I put my garage in the front yard? And so I would be very hesitant to, to go away from the standard that we have now requiring those, those, uh, those structures to be in the backyard. Just my thoughts. Well, I, I, I totally appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. I, um, my, my comment is not – I think that Mr. Markergaard indicated that um, I, I, we, we've defined accessory dwelling units – as accessory structure, and as accessory structure, we should enforce the code uniformly. Maybe my proposal is maybe accessory dwelling units shouldn't be classified as accessory structures because they don't perform the same function. Um, so I can table that, but I probably will bring that back uh, because I really do want us to loosen up the ability for accessory dwelling units to be built in, in Bloomington. I, I can think of exact a, a, wonder, a one place, not that it will ever happen here, but um, our good friends over at um, on Norman Ridge, there's this one there's this one house that's literally you know a quarter of a mile up its lot, and there's just this open space, which is lovely. Don't get me wrong, but if they wanted to put a cottage home there as an accessory dwelling unit, they, we're going to tell them that they can't. And I don't know. I just seems like that's not necessarily what we want to do here. Um, so, in in the interest of moving this along. I understand what the goal is here, uniformity, right? I would say that my comment would be I maybe we revisit whether or not accessory dwelling units should be classified as accessory structures and that would that we can have that conversation separately. So, is that okay? Very very good that. Very good. Okay. So, I'll table that one. Um on P, um this is another one where I I don't necessarily understand the application here. I I get the the standard. Um I have a neighbor, I have two neighbors, 86th Street and DuPont, 86th Street and Emerson, 86th Street and DuPont has had a side yard set, uh, side yard, eight foot, six foot, eight foot fence um, on their side yard, which is the DuPont, the DuPont Street side, not the 86th Street side, the DuPont Street side, um, has had a fence there, a privacy fence since forever. 86 and, and Emerson wants to do the exact same thing, literally a block away, and can't because of stuff like this. And so, um, again, my, my question would be, on a corner lot, when you have two, two effectively what we call two front yards, because we consider that for streets, is that appropriate? Because that's what we're, that's what we're doing here, is we're, 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 we're 
limiting people who are on corners from putting privacy fences in their in their side yard um, because we don't consider them having a side yard, which doesn't really make sense to me. So um, I will throw that one out there as a as another um, consideration. And I have uh, pictures I can show you of like that exact scenario, literally a block away on the exact same lot. Southeast corner of the intersection, exact same place, a block away from each other. One gets it, the other one doesn't. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So um, I would I would love us if we could think about side yards and, and opening up that definition to include literally the side yard, like whichever street is dominant, the other one is a side yard. The other one is not an also front yard or something to that effect. So I, I will say I appreciate the, the comments, and, and I will say the way the way we've done these in the past, the way this basically works, if you want to pull one, that's why we letter them very specifically. Right. If you want to pull those out, uh, what, what we're trying to do is come to consensus on everything, uh, and those that we don't, we pull out, we have this discussion, and then ultimately we vote on it, whether or not you can get three others to agree with you regarding this, or whether or not we set it aside and continue the discussion, or whether or not we just move forward with it. You know? so sure. Um, so that that's... I, so what we could do with even with the the previous one was it N N we, with N and P I mean we could do we could have both of those pulled out and then and then whatever final one that you have uh, you said uh, I think R R N P R uh, yeah. N P R very good yeah I know I know uh, it's, it's the it's the brain working overtime yep uh, but we could pull those out we could have those discussions and then ultimately vote on them one way or another so would you prefer to for me to just um, make a motion to pull them out and talk about them separately first and let get the other things passed. Why don't we do that? That, that might make more okay. sense. We can, we can be a little bit more efficient Was, with all of this. Council okay. Member Sounds good. Okay. So I just had one, one uh, uh, just for, for clarity. It, it sounds like the P1 and the N1, uh, well, I, I'm going to add on to the, my interest of the N being pulled in the P1, but the L1, just a quick question around that. I know we have you know a, a structured form with that. Uh, do other cities do that? Is there any risks uh, at all uh, with with a letter being sent in uh, that you know doesn't include all of those details? You know what I mean? Where you you, you send in a letter and one of them is missing and somebody misses that, you know, from staff and does that put us in a position at all? I'm just I'm just concerned. I mean, if other cities do it, no no big deal. And there's no no big problem with it. But I'm just concerned. You know, we must have had that for a reason. So. Uh, Mayor, council member, I am I'm not aware of the benchmark of other communities or if this has ever had any legal ramifications, so I defer to uh, planning manager Mark Agard for more information on that. Mr. Mark Agard? Yeah, Mayor Bussey, council member Lohman, um, we, we are aware of other cities that um, have moved away from, you know, the paper wet signatures and uh, Bloomington, we're certainly trying to do that too with electronic submittals. Um, we believe this would just simplify our processes, allow things like email uh, submittals of signatures. Oftentimes the property owner may be remote. It's just hard to physically get their signature on the same document that they're submitting. Oh, thank you for clarifying. I thought this had to do with um... I didn't realize this was uh, some kind of electronic uh, update. Okay, thank you for, for setting me straight. Okay, I got it. Thank you. No problem with it. You can leave it just as is. Fine. Councilmember Nelson. Thanks, Mayor. Just a very quick uh, clarification on M. Um, did I hear correctly that the cumulative would start with passage of this and not be retroactive? And did I also hear that our practice had been previously to treat it as cumulative? Mayor, council member, uh, yes, I believe those two things are both true um, at, at the same time. Um, so it's uh, we've interpreted as cumulative, um, and I believe that when we received pushback on, um, on that interpretation that we didn't have anything in code that we could point to. And so we, as, as we've talked within the division, we do recognize that by putting a date, it does then um, uh, remove our ability to retroactively um, stay that. But we do, we 
the the consensus is that I've received from um, my supervisors that um, that is the direction that we wish to go for more clarity. Okay. Um, just a quick thought on it. I appreciate the clarity. Can we give you the authority? <laughs> it's like, do we do we have that power? Ms. Mayor, Mayor members, uh, when you're when you're putting in a cumulative, we don't often put dates, we don't often draft dates into ordinances, but in something like this where you have to we have, you have to start sort of day one, you have to establish day one, uh, and in this instance you do. We're going to need a date. If you want us to come up with a different date, you could give us a different date tonight, um, other than December twenty eighth, twenty twenty three, but we need a we need a day one. Can day one be in the past? Ms. Mandershine? Uh, Mayor members, I believe, I know this isn't answering your question directly, but I believe the intent of December 28th is that that's the date of publication. Um, is that accurate? I believe it is. I got a calendar right here. Um, so that would be typically the effective date of something. If there is a specific date into the past, I guess the danger would be that the conditions of anything that's in the works are changing midstream. I don't know if we have anything in process right now that would be impacted by this. Maybe Glenn or Mallory know that. Uh, I, I would uh, defer to count, uh, Glenn. <laughs> Mr. Markergaard? Uh, Mayor Bussey Council members, there have been uh, additions over the years that if we could go retroactively would uh, be counted on, on different sites. Um, our ideal, if, if it's okay from a legal standpoint, would be to have that date uh, be the original adoption date of the nonconformity standards. I don't have that date in front of me, but um, we could find that very quickly. So wanna, um, if, if there are questions, any additional questions, I, I, we got ahead of ourselves here. We got, we got into the discussion phase before our public hearing. And uh, I apologize for that, we, we, we got way ahead of ourselves. And so while, while staff is looking up answers to uh, Councilmember Nelson's question, and while Councilmember D'Alessandro is contemplating exactly where we wanna go here, what I would like to do is open up the public hearing. And uh, again, my apologies for getting into the discussion before we actually did that. So I will open up the public hearing right now on item 4.5. This is our public hearing regarding miscellaneous issues ordinances for 2023. Anyone in the chambers wishing to speak to item 4.5 this evening? Mr. Sable, is there anyone on the phone? Uh, Mayor and council members, no one on the line. Last call for anyone in the chambers? Council, no one on the cha in the chamber is coming forward. No one on the phone. I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.5. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to close the public hearing on item 4.5. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. So as we now dive into discussion, uh, from what I've, what I've gathered from folks that we've as we've been going so far, it sounds like the uh, the cleanup issues, items A through I, seem to be non-controversial. Is that correct? What I would like to do then is I'd like to look for a motion to adopt ordinances A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, as included in the meeting packet, thereby amending chapters 21 and 22 of the city code. So moved, as stated. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua, to uh, adopt the items as stated. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. So then as we move to items J through R, what I have heard thus far is that we have NPR that folks want to talk about. Are there others that folks would like to pull out and talk about? Councilmember Nelson? M. So M-N-P-R, very good. M-N-P-R, any others? Um, Mr. Mayor, I would actually, given what we did discuss on N, I could, I could, um, I could let that pass for now. Okay. On N is in Nancy. Okay, so throw N back. Now we're just in NPR. Now we're just at NPR. So we, as long as we consider that, 
Anything additional, folks, other than uh, M, P, and R? If not, uh, just to keep things moving along here, I would look for a motion to adopt the ordinances J, K, L, N, O, P, Q, and Q as included in the meeting packet, thereby amending chapters 15, 19, 21, and Appendix A of the City Code. So moved as stated. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, actually, you mentioned P, but I would like to hold P. Oh, did I misstate that? I apologize. Let me restate it. Ordinances J, K, L, N, O, Q. That's right. Very good. So Thank moved you. as stated. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to adopt the ordinances as stated under item uh, 4.5 in tonight's public hearing agenda. No further council discussion on the motion as stated. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. So now, doubling back, should we just do them in alphabetical order? I was always taught to use the alphabet whenever possible. So uh, let's start with uh, item M. Uh, Councilmember Nelson, you had questions specifically on this and about the, uh, the active date. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I, and I think I'd, I'd look to uh, Glenn if he's got that date, if he was able to find it. Mr. Markegaard? Yes, uh, Mayor Busey, Councilmember Nelson. It looks like the section was originally adopted January 14th of 2008. However, there may be uh, some legal concerns with um, going uh, back in time, but I'll, I'll defer to legal on that. Ms. Mandershad? Yeah, Mayor members, 2008 was a long time ago. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the, the same issue that I raised earlier about on the fly uh, retroactive dates and any potential sort of change conditions. People may have organized their proposals differently had they known that they're going to be able to count all the way back to 2008. Um, and I wouldn't want to open us up to any unintended uh, liability on that at, uh, end of things. You could propose to continue this. We could do a little more research and come back. You've already done the public hearing. You could continue this part of it. Um, you know, a decision on this to the next meeting or, um, I don't know, I'll defer to Glenn and Mallory on what their preference is on how to move forward that way. Or you can take action on it tonight or you can just do no action on it. Um, well, up to you, obviously, and, but... Um, thank you. Uh, I, I think I agreed going back to 2008 might be a bit far and um, uh, I would hate to open us up to legal jeopardy. Uh, the If the proposed active date is the date of publication, which is 12 23 uh, I might suggest that, but I will leave it up to the person who pulled it out. And yeah, Thank you, Mayor. And I guess, you know, part of my thought in terms of the jeopardy is it seemed to me from what I heard is that it was common understanding that it was cumulative. So this isn't really a change from how staff has been operating or what may have been told to people. Um, it's a clarification. Maybe we did have somebody ask a question about it, but um, which is why I would prefer to go back um, to 28, which you know isn't that long ago. It's 15 years. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> so I, I just, I mean, if this is the way that. As staff and everyone has always assumed it was just putting what everyone assumed it was into code in my mind is is not that problematic but there's probably things I'm missing councilmember Loman so my suggestion um, I tend to agree with with the mayor on this one I'm I'm supportive of what you're trying to do but I would be um, I would not feel comfortable doing this tonight I might suggest if you know, if we got you know, a couple other folks who'd be willing to do it, you know, push this into another meeting so that staff could, could do some research to see if there's any adverse effect. Um. Council Member Moore? Yes, I, I'd be supportive of that as well. So uh, supportive of a, of a continuing item in and see if the, the staff could do a bit more research and if there is uh, no additional or to figure out what the what the impact might be. Yep. Mr. Verbrugge. Mr. Mayor and Council members, uh, why don't we see what happens with P 
P, I th or was it R? We still have uh, some discussion or question on. So let's um, see where we're at and if council wants to continue on those and maybe wrap it into one Good idea. Uh, okay. motion. Okay. Uh, I, w I would actually recommend, because we've tried to have a date certain when we continue items, is that we actually push it out to like February 12th just because staff has uh, items lined up here for the next month. So if we're adding something into the work plan, there isn't anything urgent about this. That gives them a little bit of time to do some good research and not have to necessarily bump some other stuff right away. That makes sense. All right, so if we're good with that, if we can just kind of put this on the shelf for just a moment and then move on to, uh, I believe we have P and R that we still would like to can, uh, can talk about. Ms. Uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, the, so again, the, the, um, I understand the intent of the cleanup, um, and um, I just struggle with the definition of a side or reared yard here when we're talking about corner streets. Um, it seems unduly, first off, it doesn't seem uniquely applied as exampled by my own neighborhood where I have a block away, one has one, one doesn't. And then secondly, um, it, it seems like a... Um, I don't know, I just struggle with the idea that we would tell somebody just simply because of an, like some kind of a, an arbitrary aesthetic who owns a corner house that they can't put a privacy fence on their side yard. I, I don't know, I struggle with it from a, on a, like an individual rights basis here in terms of personal property. Um, and I don't necessarily, um, I don't know that we're making it better by, by enforcing this I mean, and I understand, again, I understand the uh, amendment and I understand what they're trying to clean up here, uh, but I struggle with it on, I don't know, on personal rights grounds, if you will. Yeah. Councilmember Lohman and Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember uh, Lohman. Thank you. Um, gosh, I'd love to use my, my, my house on this one because if we didn't have a, have, a, have a fence up there now or a or a brush up there now, I, I think that we would have a problem. So it'd be interesting to, to bring that up in a number of other, other places. But uh, so my question around this is, uh, to be more specific, is around the Clearview Triangle and how this deals with that. If you could help me to understand how this impacts, uh, you know, that, you know, that, that, that Clearview Triangle piece. How is that supported? How is it not supported? Yeah, Mayor Council Member Lohman. Um, so the, uh, the with the Clearview Triangle um, in the areas that are 15 feet um, from um, either a driveway or a corner, um, you cannot build a fence that is greater than three feet in height. And so that that is is set. It would not be impacted by this this ordinance change. And so you know, given that, um, isn't there a way to do that with a side yard? Uh, you know, to, to set that same type of standard, you know, as you as you as you work with a with a side yard, why, why do this instead of doing something more similar to that? Um, the uh, so the I believe the the or am I am I not understanding this? You know, that, 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 is that what this is? Um, so this is. Uh, let me let me see if I have a. Let's see. A second slide that provides some examples. So, um, currently, um, the uh, you if you wanted to build um, a fence on the side or an eight foot side yard fence, um, can you see my cursor on the screen? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, you wouldn't um, put it between the structure and um, the house. It would extend from the house in it. Um, and, I believe a six foot fence or seven foot fence is allowed without a permit, but an eight foot fence, we require a permit. Um, so there is a, um, so that's the standard as it exists right now. The, the issue is, is that this shifted with the prevailing setback um, and, and that understanding. And so we um, try to bring um, the fence setback back into alignment with what it was before the prevailing setback was removed. And so the, in general, it was to keep the open design by the streets. So when people are, are walking um, in front of the streets that they can kind of see on, on both sides um, and to limit site obstructions, um, as it 
the for the corner and the side lot the in this example the the clear view triangle would be extending in this corner um if well if this were a corner lot then it would be the 15 feet along this corner i think I'm not sure if i answered your question no i think you've, you've answered my question in the sense that so that doesn't impact this but is there a way to take that same standard and apply it all the way back um using that same methodology as opposed to what has been proposed today. Mm. Um, I would, I would have to defer to planning manager Mark guard to talk about the feasibility of doing something like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I get what you're saying. So yeah, in my yard, that would not impact that at all um, because we're underneath that, that eight foot. But if I tried to put an eight foot fence and it's, it still wouldn't be in that clear view triangle, but with this, it would be, it would be impact. I could not do that. I could not bring it all the way up to eight feet. And I know that we've approved um, on Xerxes probably a couple of years ago. We approved one. We went. Uh, we approved a foot fence um, for privacy uh, reasons because of you know something very similar to this. I, I just hate to see a bunch of folks come in just for that, just to try to get approval. You know. So, Mr. Markegard, anything to add? Sure, uh, Mayor Bussey. Councilmember Loman, I think a couple of things going on here. One is the situation, say you have a 50 foot or 65 foot setback for a house. Um, back in May, with a single family and two family code amendments, uh, that prevailing setback standard uh, was removed. So one of the kind of unintended consequences of that uh, that we did not anticipate is that now theoretically you could build uh, a screen fence at uh, 30 feet, even though your house is back at 50 feet or 65 feet. So the intention of this change tonight is to um, get rid of that unintended consequence of removing prevailing setback. But there is another issue at play which uh, council member D'Alessandro raised, which is the fact that Bloomington treats um, yards adjacent to a street, whether they're side or front, identically in terms of whether you, or not you can have a screen fence. Uh, some cities do not do that. They would treat uh, one of the, one of the, on a corner lot, one of the sides differently than the other. Um, Bloomington, chose not to back in 2009 when the fence standards were adopted. It's certainly something we can revisit if that's desired, um, but it's not part of what's before you tonight. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my question is sort of a tangent of Councilmember D'Alessandro's, but with regards to the rear yard um, and how that's impacted, um, uh, I know some specific properties in my district that are, um, they have streets on three sides of them and based on our fence standards, if they put a fence in what is their backyard, which is adjacent to a street, their backyard becomes like five feet because it has to meet the building setbacks or something like that. So it's very difficult for them to meet that. I don't think that's the intent of what we're cleaning up here, but if there is going to be a larger conversation, I'd like to put that into the mix along with the side yard setback. So I don't mean to take up a lot of time on it tonight if we're gonna have continuing conversation. Anyone else want to weigh in on P this evening? Item P. So uh, Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, yeah. Do do we want to continue this? Do we want? Uh, do you have additional questions that would help clarify, or, or are you looking for more information? Or? No, I mean, I, like I said, I'm I'm clear on what the the um, what the accommodation or the um, a, adjustment is here to to clean up the language. Um, I have more of a problem with the with the um, the 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 code itself than I do the language. Got it. So. Um, if we are, if, if I'll just, if, if the right thing to do is for me to get, to say to you all, um, yeah, I'm going to ask you all to think about this a little differently going forward, then that's a different conversation than what we're having at the moment. And I get that. Um, I'm just not, I didn't want it to go by without us having a conversation that says 
this is an area of, of opportunity for us to revisit, to give people a little bit more flexibility back in their, in their, um, and, 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 and for the record, like when you're talking about a house and it's really clear where like by their address and their front, you know, door and everything, which is the front yard and which is not, I struggle with the idea that we treat corner lots differently than we would my own yard, which is the second house in. That's all I'm saying. So, um, all that having been said, um, we can, if, if everybody's okay, what I'll do when we get to organizational business is just bring this back and have a conversation about whether or not we want to consider addressing our, the code. That's, I'm going to do the same thing with accessory dwelling units. And then just to cover off, if I may, Mr. Mayor, um, on R, I, again, don't understand why film isn't okay, especially in like medical or veterinary circumstances, like the idea that you can have complete coverage of, of a portion of your, of your window for the purposes of, of, of privacy, um, where blinds are never a hundred percent covered, right? Um, I just don't know why we're doing that to people. <laughs> I, I, um, you know, the, so these things are coming up because of the cleanup. I won't prevent us from cleaning these up, but these are three specific, it's very interesting. These are very three very specific things that just in the last three months have been brought up to me explicitly uh, by residents. Um, so I'm bringing them up now to say like, we have, I think we have some, some things we can do here to make this a little bit easier for folks. So um, all that having been said, I'm not going to, uh, unless anybody else is enthusiastic like I am about tabling these, I will um, happily vote the changes in, but I'd like to bring these back for the actual discussion on code change. Councilmember Nelson? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would support either approach, Councilmember D'Alessandro, if we uh, approve them tonight or if we table them and bring it back as a larger package but i would support your effort to look at actually all of those I have the same concerns about r as well and the window screening i, I know I conversations earlier in the year with the city manager about a specific situation there so yeah Great. so so for so uh so please How we bring these back? I think that's that. That would be an acceptable solution. I think to folks or okay. yes. Why don't we? Okay. Do do. Um, why don't, why in the interest make a of motion? time, should we bundle them again? Why don't you make the motion to bundle uh, item M, item P, and item R, and we'll approval on those. I will uh, uh, move to adopt ordinances M, P, and R as included in the meeting packet thereby amending chapters 15, 19, 21, and Appendix A of the City Code. Do we have a second? Second. <laughs> Council Ma uh, motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin. Um, Council discussion. Was one of them, though, should we continue the one? Was that M, where we were waiting to get some specific dates back? That one I think we should just continue. Um, the other two, I think we should do exactly as um, the motion says we should so, do it. So, so I'm amending them. You want to amend the motion to remove M from it? That's what I'd like to do, yeah. Second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we're gonna have How much trouble are we getting in here now? <laughs> amendment to the amendment, I, sir? I think you're fine. Okay. Yep. Yeah. We understand where you do, what you're doing. All right. So the motion has been amended to remove M, so let's just work on the, the, the motion right now is to uh, approve items P and R, uh, ordinance P and R as included in the meeting packet. Everybody Just to be clear, that? Mayor, who the motion and the seconder is? Uh, Councilmember Dallas Martin, D'Alessandro and Martin. Okay. Yep. Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, I just want to be clear that we're voting on the amendment, right? No. To remove M? Nope, we are voting right now on we're doing hybrid right. parliamentary we're, 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 we're voting Okay, I just want to, that's why I want to ask yep, because. We're voting on PNR right now okay. and we will come back and vote on M. Okay. To, to, to continue that or table. All right, I just wanted to be clear because that's not what I heard, so. We did not. We're, 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 okay. Yep. okay. Yep. We've got a motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin to adopt ordinances PNR as included in the meeting packet. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0.
Councilmember D'Alessandro, item M. So we are moving to continue item M uh, until it sounded February 18th, you said? 12th. 12th. February 12th. 12th. Thank you. Moving to continue item uh, an ordinance M to February 12th. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman to continue item M until February 12th, 2024. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Uh, some summary publication then, Mr. Mayor? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Okay. Um, I move to adopt resolution authorizing summary publication of all all. 2023 miscellaneous issue ordinances except M. Okay. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin for a summary, summary publication as stated. No further council discussion on this. All of them in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7 0. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the conversation. We will move on to our final item under uh, for this evening, and this is a uh, an adoption of the Active Transportation Action Plan. We will have a public comment opportunity on this one. Our assistant traffic engineer, Amy Marone, is here to bring us through once again on the uh, Active Transportation Plan, which we talked about not too recently, not, not too long ago, excuse me, very recently, not too long ago. <laughs> Correct. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Mayor and Council. Yeah, we were here two weeks ago to hear an overview of the Active Transportation Action Plan and here tonight to request a approval of the plan. So, um, so this is an overview, again, of the information that was presented at the December 4th meeting. And one more time, just for the listening public, um, you can find get access to our plan at the Let's Talk page under blm.mn slash Let's Talk. Scroll down to the Public Works and Construction Projects, and then under the Active Transportation Plan link, you can click on that circle to have access to the full plan. So... What is active transportation? Active transportation is a way of getting around using human power, walking, biking, and rolling. And rolling refers to people using a wheelchair, stroller, scooter, or other assisted mobility device. Um, what is included in our active transportation plan? So it's a Bloomington-specific document that will define strategies and actions to guide the city in making walking and bicycling safer and more accessible for the people of all ages and abilities. And then foundational to our plan was um, having equity infu infused throughout the goals and recommendations. So there is a focus where people rely on walking and biking the most, focus on safety, specifically near busy roadways, and then a focus to invest where there's a lack of active transportation links, such as gaps in unconnected areas. Why is active transportation important in Bloomington? So the city of Bloomington believes that walking, biking, and rolling are critical ways by which people of all ages and abilities reach the places they want to go, connect with the people they want to see, and improve their physical and mental health. The city also identifies active transportation as an essential tool for improving environmental health and reducing the city's carbon footprint. Here's a few examples of how, how each of those elements break out. So in Bloomington, we feel that car ownership should not be a requirement for getting around safely in Bloomington. From the environmental perspective, Bloomington's Energy, Active Trans Energy Action Plan 2035 goals have a transportation element that suggests that we, per or that prescribes that we pursue all viable opportunities for prom promoting the elimination of vehicle emissions, including adding biking and pedestrian infrastructure. And then from an economy perspective, people walking and biking make more frequent trips to local amenities than people driving, so they're spending more money at local businesses. Um, active transportation also makes a great connection to our health and all policies goals as it supports um, active lifestyles and the healthy benefits, encourages social connection, and promotes opportunities for happiness. So again, a summary of the plan. We went through in quite a bit of detail the la at the last meeting. So I um, just 
mostly want to focus on a bit of the process that we use to go through the plan, and then we do have a list of the strategies that were recommended. So um, creation of the plan started in November of 2022 and was um, completed in August of 23. The active transportation planning team um, had representatives from across city staff, including public works, public health, public safety, sustainability, parks, equity and inclusion, and co-ed. Um, we also were developing this plan under assistance from a MnDOT active transportation grant and had um, consulting assistance from Samantha Lorenz with Terrasoma and Meredith Banesh with HDR. We had a very um, heavy public engagement strategy. So since we were working from our existing alternative transportation plan, which identified a very solid system, um, ATP system throughout the city, um, one of the keys for this uh, update in our plan was to have pub heavy public engagement and help to develop a shared vision. So we worked with co-ed and did a lot of public outreach. Um, we had online comments, a comment map and survey, um, pop-up community conversations at the farmer's market, Creekside, Southtown apartments, and more. Um, walking workshops, uh, school engagement session, bike focus group meeting, and a network mapping and action planning workshop that took place in the Civ Civic Plaza Black Box Theater. So um, through our public engagement with the online comments, we received over 147 specific comments from residents and users of our system identifying locations where they either had a positive experience or where they mostly where they saw opportunities and really were requesting um, specific focus. In our community walks, we um, had a walk in each of the four different council districts. Um, this was really pretty eye-opening and a, a good opportunity to see the existing conditions um, in the winter. And we got a lot of good feedback through that process as well. Um, the overarching themes that we heard from the public engagement were pretty broad range, but they, they really ranged from um, old, that people want to be on Old Shakopee Road and that we really should focus some efforts along that corridor all the way to um, you know, focusing on our winter maintenance of existing facilities. So again, without going into too much detail of the actual plan recommendations, um, we do have this priority network labeled that is a recommendation from the plan, identifies 18 segments that are prioritized, prioritized um, just again to note that they are numbered but not ranked. Here's an example of what each of the, each of the recommendations for these um, segments looks like. Here's the full list of the 18 different segments that are identified in the plan. And then we also have a list throughout the document of op overarching recommendations that focus on three areas. So street design and operations, walking, and biking, and provide um, documents or help <laughs> recommendations for prioritization of updating documents um, and policies and practices throughout the city. So we're getting close to the end of our path for acceptance of the plan. Um, we visited the Sustainability Commission, Planning Commission, um, and the City Council two weeks ago. And tonight, um, we're requesting an opportunity for the public to be able to speak, on the, speak to the plan as well. Um, some of the comments that we heard at the Planning Commission, they did vote to recommend that the City, city Council accept the plan. Um, the feedback that we received from the Planning Commission was to focus on an improved active trans transit fa tra transportation facilities along Old Shakopee Road and to coordinate with Hennepin County um, to take a look, an additional look at some of the missing connectivity, um, which is a regional connection to the Fort Snelling area. Um, prioritize connections to and along Lindale following the ga Lindale Gateway Plan and to consider doing some demonstration projects um, with community events such as Summer Fet or Farmer's Market. Sustainability Commission also provided a recommendation to the City Council to accept the Active Transportation Action Plan in alignment with the Bloomington's, with Bloomington's cli Climate Goals, excuse me. 
Um, some of their comments said that they would like to see additional focus on developing a tree canopy to improve the usefulness of the active transportation facilities in the summer. That is something that is referenced in the plan, but they're just um, we're requesting that that have some additional prioritization and to build in a timeline to um, to review and update the plan in the future. Um, their letter of recommendation was included in your packet. And then, again, at the meeting two weeks ago, some of the comments that we did hear from the city council um, were to make sure that we're including wayfinding and publicly sharing information about the existing and um, rollout of new facilities to focus on destinations in the community. And remember that this is not just a recreational plan, but it really is a, a transportation plan. And to look for measurable outcomes, including facility usage. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions, and again, we do request that this is um, available for public comments. Very good, thank you so much. Okay. Council, as I said, we had this conversation, a pretty lengthy conversation just a couple of weeks ago. Any additional questions of Ms. Marone <laughs> in the last couple of weeks? If not, uh, we did want to make sure that we had an opportunity for uh, some public comments. Uh, so I will open now a public comment opportunity on item 4.6. This is regarding our active transportation action plan adoption. Anyone in the council chambers wish to uh, publicly comment about item 4.6? Anyone on the phone? Mr. Mayor, council members, no one on the line. No one on the line. We're uh, last chance for anybody here in the council chambers. No one coming forward, so I will close the public comment opportunity on item 4.6, our active transportation action plan adoption. Council, questions on this or um, anything to add after our discussion of just a couple of weeks ago on this? Council member Mua. Thank you, Mayor. I think mine is just more of a comment. Um, I just want to say how excited I am about this. Uh, my my in-laws grew up here, and when I listened to my father-in-law's stories of how he could bike from Lindale to West Bush Lake without being scared of being run over by cars, this gets me really excited. You know, it's not the 70s, Bloomington's fully built out now, but when I think about when my kids grow up and they're riding their bikes by themselves, I want to see them do that. And so I'm very excited to see this happening and that we're actively pursuing options to allow people to freely move within our community. So I'm very, very happy that we've done this work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Moore. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, I second that. I, the only recommendation I'd make over and above anything that we've talked about before is just that we, um, we, we make sure that as part of our, um, as part of our um, uh, outcome uh, approach that we think about, you know, um, being able to measure um, you know, the number of like how many more miles of trail do we have and how much of that is contiguous and, you know, what is the feedback we're getting from those new things, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if there's a place for it in our, um, you know, in our dashboards, uh, but I think it's a big enough of a, of a, of a deal and um, that it's worth us doing some, you know, tracking along sustainability grounds on, on, you know, in terms of, emissions reduction uh, or, you know, activity level, public health, whatever whatever measurements we want to use. Um, I'd love to see a piece of the dashboard of, for our strategic planning dedicated to some of the outcomes associated with this. I think it's a really big deal. So, thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments? Council Member Lohman? I, I'm ready to move it. I got one brief comment. Uh, I appreciate the fact that it's a living, living document. And so I think you know I've, I've made my comments, and so I'm going to look forward as we move forward that I can kind of execute in the living document uh, on some stuff. So Very good. But if we're ready to go, I'm, I'm happy to move I don't it. see any other hands going up. Councilmember Lohman. I'll move to adopt an active transportation action plan. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua to adopt the active transportation active action plan. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good work on this. This was a big, a big effort, I know, and it involved a lot of staff members, so I appreciate uh, your leadership on this, and I appreciate your herding all those cats to bring it all together, and I appreciate everybody walking around in the winter to figure out the best way to 
to make it all work. So well done. Thank you so much. Yep. We will move on now to our organizational business. Uh, and our first item under organizational business is item 5.1, is the City Manager Performance Evaluation Summary and Employment Agreement. And as you all know, and I, I'm sure the members of the public know, uh, the City Council has exactly one employee, and that's the City Manager. There's an employment agreement between the city and the city manager that defines the terms and the conditions of employment. And in that employment agreement, uh, both parties agree that a performance evaluation process is, uh, is appropriate. On Monday, December 11th, the city held a closed session with city manager Jamie Verbrugge for the purpose of conducting the city manager's annual performance evaluation. Mr. Verbrugge was evaluated in the areas of leading, managing, and developing staff, financial management through effective and efficient service delivery, focus on strategic priorities, meaningful and inclusive resident involvement, innovation and appropriate risk-taking, and relationship with the City Council. The Council agreed that Mr. Verbrugge has excelled in the area of focusing on strategic priorities. We also had consensus that Mr. Verbrugge is regularly meeting and exceeding expectations in the areas of innovation and in maintaining open and trusting relationships with the City Council. We also agree that we'd like to see Mr. Verbrugge continue to be more strategic in communicating City issues to the public and media, that we'd like to have a better sense of how he is leading organizational development efforts, and that we'd like to see continued focus when preparing budgets on evaluating the services we provide and doing so in the most cost-effective way possible. Uh, the more specific results of the performance evaluation were these. The City Council found that the City Manager's performance met the expectations of the City Council. The City Council agreed to extend the City Manager's contract from January 1, 2024 to December 31, 2024. The City Council agreed to set the City Manager's compensation at an annual base salary of $220,000, and the City Council agreed to contribute a $25,000 payment to the Deferred Compensation Plan of the City Manager's choice. That is the general summary of our closed meeting session with the City Manager uh, with, the, uh, with the intention of uh, conducting an annual performance evaluation. Council, uh, unless there are specific questions about what I mentioned without uh, getting into too much and, and making sure that we don't violate that closed meeting that we did have. If there are specific questions or additions to what we had talked about, uh, I'd, I'd appreciate those now. Um, or, uh, Mr. Verbrugge, if there's anything else you would like to add. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, and, and just for anybody in the community who's watching, I just want to state again what a uh, privilege it is to have this uh, position. Um, this is frankly one of the most dynamic environments in uh, Minnesota for any city and uh, I am grateful to have the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Lohman. <clears throat> Mayor, I just want to thank you uh, for organizing uh, uh, the effort. It does take a little bit extra work uh, to do that. Uh, coaxing some city council members uh, to get their stuff in on time. I won't point anybody out. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Council seeing no more comments, I will move to approve an employment agreement between the city manager and the city of Bloomington. We have a motion and a second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to approve an employment agreement between the city manager and the city of Bloomington. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Congratulations. You're one more year. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> At, least. <laughs> At least, yes. Until next year. Until next year. Moving on to item 5.2, our final uh, item of this evening, and that is our city council policy and issue update. And I will kick it off with just a couple of things here very quickly. First of all, just a, a recap of our, our 26th listing session of 2023. And we had one speaker tonight, Brent Weems. Um, uh, Brent, it, I think he, he's in the trades. I think he said he was a plumber, did he? Mm -hmm. And the, the company-issued truck that he is asked to bring home and then go to work using uh, is officially too large to park in his driveway and too large by city code and city requirements in terms of what you can park in your driveway. Uh, and Brent asked us if there was anything that we could do about it or if there was an appeal process and so on. So we had a good discussion with Brent. We asked our uh, city attorney, to look into the specifics around it and see exactly what might be done. Uh, did point out to Brent that officially there is no appeal process, but it is something we could consider because we all know that since the pandemic, 
uh, work patterns have changed significantly in a number of different industries, and it might be something that we want to look at and uh, evaluate um, a bit differently in the work realities of 2024 in just a few days, uh, as opposed to 2019 or 2020. So uh, the world has changed, and maybe we need to change along with it. So we'll take a look at that. As I mentioned, uh, we've had 26 listening sessions, and with Mr. Weems, who he had not heard from before, uh, we've had a total of 54 total speakers and 37 unique speakers, and more than half of those speakers hadn't spoke before us in the past. And so it, I think just in terms of what we set out to accomplish with our listening session, as opposed to the public comment period here in the, in the council chambers, um, I would say it's, it, it has been a success. We, uh, at the end of our first year last year, uh, we had written into the idea that we were, I was going to report out and we were going to kind of vote on it, and I wasn't sure if I needed to report out again this year. I thought it was a good idea, just because it shows the, um, the, the impact that this has had, the number of people that have come forward, the, the different types of conversations that we've had with people that we know and that we don't know. And uh, I think it's been a, definitely a worthwhile thing. Um, uh, I don't see any reason to change, unless I see a, a lot of shaking heads that we should be changing this in some way. I think it's working very well, and I'd like to continue with the current situation, the current setup that we have as listening sessions. And um, I think it's, it's just been as successful as we hoped it would be when we, we, we made the change uh, a, a couple of years ago now. Councilmember Lowman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> uh, I always like to push for change. So I think we, we've, uh, you know, maybe we're not there yet, but, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in terms of, of, and I'm not saying every single time we need to change it, but I wonder if, 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 a, if well, once a quarter or once a year we try a different time to have uh, a listening session to kind of open that up, uh, to try it a little bit differently, um, maybe even uh, consider moving when we comment about uh, those listening sessions to the front end of the meeting. I don't know how that works, but just want to kind of challenge us to, to always be trying to be innovative around uh, that, that particular uh, idea. It is working well. Um, I do like it, but uh, I think we ought to challenge uh, the, that, you know, we, we did it for so many years the way it was before, and uh, we shouldn't be stuck in uh, old practices, you know, uh, of, of doing it. But I, I do like we, and I, 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 want to thank you also for bringing back a report uh, each year uh, if you do that uh, with that but it would, would want to challenge you or challenge this body too to to continue to find ways to be innovative with the processes and it doesn't have to be every time but maybe once to try something different or try something. thank you council member appreciate that any other comments on that council mr verbrugge no additional comments mr mayor council member martin oh uh, okay oh never mind <laughs> I didn't. I thought you meant on that specific topic. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm calling on Councilmember Martin. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Well, that's. I can go off on the listening session if you want. <laughs> I got material. Uh, well, as as is the annual tradition, uh, I would love to to move forward some recognition for staff and the incredible work uh, that that I was so excited to talk about earlier in the meeting. Uh, and I know we've provided, uh, I think it's a paid half day holiday on Friday the 22nd. And I know Mr. Verbrugge, if you have some more context around that. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, as always, uh, staff uh, appreciates uh, Council's um, gratitude and uh, demonstrating that gratitude with uh, uh, some amount of holiday leave time. Uh, because Christmas is on uh, Monday and that's, that's the official um, recognition of the holiday, that's the day that our, um, uh, all of our collective bargaining units and uh, all the um, employee uh, handbooks identifies day off here. Um, Friday, we will be open for business. Uh, if council agrees to extend four hours of leave for employees, we'll close city offices at noon on Friday. Um, and uh, vital services will continue. Public safety and uh, utilities uh, will continue to operate. Um, but we will notify the community starting right away tomorrow uh, just to provide a heads up that the city offices will only be open for a half day if council moves forward. And thank you. So Council Member Martin has brought forward uh, the proposal to grant uh, four days, four hours, <laughs> four hours of <laughs> vacation time on, <laughs> on Friday of uh, Friday the 22nd and um, uh, 
he's officially, I, I heard that as a motion. Did I hear that, Councilmember Martin? Second. And a second by Councilmember Carter. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor of that, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. So congratulations, staff, once again, that on, a, on an incredibly successful year over the course of the past 12 months here in the city of Bloomington. Uh, yes, Mr. Rui, this is, what? how did you do, define this, the, the most dynamic? Um, uh, environment? Environment, mm -hmm. yes. Um, that's uh, kind of putting it mildly. And appreciate all the work that our staff puts into this day in and day out throughout the year under um, un under a lot of pressure sometimes, under uh, the public scrutiny, under the scrutiny of this council. And they do it uh, very, very well every time. So happy holidays to all of our staff. And enjoy the weekend and enjoy the time with your family. So very happy that we're able to do that. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you. I wanted to... Uh, uh, right off the bat, just uh, I know we had talked earlier about uh, bringing a, an ordinance uh, back or language for that. So I wanted to move uh, the staff bring back language for ordinance uh, that uh, addresses wage theft and other unfair uh, labor practices. So uh, I, we can do this as a, a motion and an acceptance, or as we typically do in this, um, if we can get four nodding heads or five nodding heads. Uh, I think it's it's as official as, as a, an official motion, but I think uh, we talked about this earlier, and I think we are directing staff, and I think we have agreement. Anybody in disagreement? I think we are in agreement that we would like staff to look into a very specific uh, wage theft ordinance and other ordinances that we can use to protect staff's understanding. Yes, Mr. very good. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I just you. wanted to formalize it so yep, that there's that. some uh, piece of that. And the secondary thing is, I d wanted to mention. Uh, uh, I'm going to miss you, Patrick. I didn't mention earlier because I already had made my statements long ago, so I didn't want to. You know, drawn on and on. That's something I do a lot. So, but I'll miss you and uh, good luck. Maybe we'll see you back again. Let's remember D'Alessandro. Um, so, uh, apologies because I know I'm holding, I'm going to get it done in two minutes, a problem. Uh, what I had one idea um, that I wanted to throw out here. One of the things I've noticed in the course of the last year is that we have our public comment opportunities oftentimes on the last day that we are l reviewing something and it feels a little bit like um, people can come make comments but we can't do anything with those comments because we're gonna vote the, like uh, right away on the thing. And so I, I was just kind of curious if as we have these long things and the active transportation is an example of that, as we have these kind of long projects that take several months to, to gel, I'm wondering if the chance for those public comment opportunities to be earlier on so that we can actually act like take action on some of the feedback that we get in those might be a better plan for us. So I throw that out there just as we think about how our work plans might work, um, that we can do something like that. Um, just because, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a way to kind of get that feedback incorporated into what we might then end up voting on. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I guess I would just ask for clarification because I think like the example you gave, there was a lot of public input and feedback incorporated into it. And then oftentimes when we have public hearings and we get feedback and we need to go, like we go back and forth, right? Like the zoning requirements, like we had an open, we had the public comment, but then we extended and like we kept having conversations. And so I guess I don't, I don't, I guess I don't, I'm just asking. Yeah, you that, that actually is a great example. And, and actually it, it, um, it, pro it might, end up proving my point in the sense that like um, we added public comment periods which we can do on purpose yeah earlier on in the process because we knew it was building to a contention uh, and so like that actually was useful because then we could actually take action on those things and so that that was my only comment like if it, it, these public comment opportunities if we can give them um, earlier on now you're right public engagement whether public engagement or pu and public comment opportunities are the same or different things that's a good question mm -hmm. um, I see them as different in the sense that there's a like we had one today where we had a public comment opportunity on this active transportation plan but if we'd have heard anything that we wanted to take action on what would we have done at that point I think we would have just postponed the vote right like we would have extended it w would we have we could have it would have been within our so I don't I guess I don't know what the change would be because we can already do that. The change would be that instead of pushing back the deadline for staff on the last day, we actually can do that up front. That's all. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge? Hey, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, there are some cities where they will have a first reading and a second reading uh, and often will not act on something if, if it is subject of a public hearing 
uh, until a subsequent meeting um, that has the effect of delaying a process. And so especially in um, like land use processes where we have a finite period of time, we have to build that extra uh, couple weeks into the schedule. Um, I think it, it's entirely up to council how you want to do this. I, I would agree with Council Member Carter is most of the things that are of high public interest have significant engagement throughout the process. Um, and I understand that, that you know, we maybe want to get more input when we have the bird fully baked, right? So um, I, I think it's just a matter for council to direct us how you want to proceed, um, knowing that uh, doing so just extends the process a little bit. Yeah, my goal is not to extend the process uh, in the sense that my, my goal is that if we did this earlier on, we wouldn't find ourselves at the last possible day going, oh, I think we need to extend this or table this or whatever. So that's that if that doesn't if it if it doesn't end up working that way, then I would I would not worry about it. So we can we can look into it um, as we see our work plans gel um, throughout the year. Um, but if 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 um, if that was if there are places like that, it I. Um, what I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to, to look disingenuous that we're saying, well, we had a public comment period, but, but that public comment ha period happened so far at the end of the process and we didn't do anything with anything we heard and we just voted anyway that it doesn't seem like people would, f would walk away from that feeling like they actually could influence the outcome. And if our goal is to try to help people influence the outcome, then I would like to try to get that information earlier on in the process. But... Um, and I guess I, my takeaway was is similar to Councilmember Carter. Uh, it, there's been a lot of public comment. There's been a lot of public engagement opportunities associated with this. Uh, I mean, I guess if we had, perhaps we should have had it Monday, uh, two weeks ago when we when we first heard it, and then even just that two week time period. Uh, so there are ways we could look at it, but um, uh, and I. I, I see what you're saying that, yeah, it maybe looks like window dressing when we have a public comment period at 10 o'clock right before we approve it, that kind of thing. But at the same time, um, the, the fact that no one was here and the fact that on, on many things we, we don't hear a lot of public comment, th that tells me that our staff is doing a good job doing getting some of that information, getting some of that public engagement work done ahead of time, and the fact that uh, a lot of folks are – are good with the work that's being done. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. Very so. fair. Very fair. Well, we can look at it on a case by case basis. Sure. If, I, if, if as we go through 2024, I see something where I'm like, "There's a good example of what I was talking about." We'll bring it up. Please. Fair enough. Um, okay. So very quickly, the three things that we talked about earlier on that I'd love to see us actually consider. I I don't know if accessory dwelling units should be classified as accessory structures because I think they have a very very specific use uh, and people live in them versus accessory structures as we've defined them are not places where people live. And so if we could think about potentially d decoupling the notion of ADUs from other types of accessory structures so we can hone in on the things that we want to do with ADUs that will truly move the needle in getting that infill done, I think that would be a smart idea. So I'd love to propose that. On um, on the film stuff, I, I just don't understand why we care what people put on their windows. I, I mean, I, I understand there's gaudiness issues and other things like that. But, like, if, if, if I'm – so, as an example, I'm, I go to the good folks at Nova Vet Clinic, and they went through hell because they have rooms where people are euthanizing their pets, and it's not – in their opinion, a secure thing, right? They can't, because it's not filmed, it was blinds, and then those blinds are open, kind of, sort of, because they're moving with the air in the room or whatever, and, you know, it doesn't feel like an environment where there's privacy, and, and somebody could, you know, do that very solemn activity without feeling like they might be being watched or whatever. Um, you know, those are the kinds of, like, medical uses, veterinary uses, other places like that, where I think we could make exceptions, but... I guess I'm wondering why we care. And so I'd love to have us, if somebody could bring back to us, like, here's the history of why we don't allow film on, on you know, windows so we could look at that. That would be great. I don't know if, Council Member Nelson, you've said you've, like, thought about this already as well. I, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, but. I have three dogs. We go to Nova Pet Clinic. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> so. Dr. Rachel, yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Verbrugge, something to add to that? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, uh, consultation with our planning manager. 
Uh, what we would propose is bringing these items back for additional discussion on the same February 12 agenda that we continued the other item to. Okay. Um, we will have the Planning uh, Commission and Planning Department uh, work plan uh, presented to the City Council on January 8th, so you'll get to see the you know how things fit into the full scope of things. Um, but I think staff uh, has a good feel from the conversation that occurred earlier, and what we'll do is bring each of those items back with the, the history of... Uh, you know, what the ordinance is trying to accomplish, uh, issues that we've uh, experienced with those particular ordinances, and uh, maybe some options that uh, the council could consider for discussion. So, uh, oh, Council Member Carter. Um, I was just going to say, related to the ADUs, I, I like how you framed it up in terms of what will come back to council, because um, I think you are highlighting one specific example mm -hmm. in the ADU policy that mm -hmm. might make it more challenging for people to be able to build an ADU, but I'd be curious, since it's been a decent amount of time since we passed the ADU standards, you know, have we seen ADUs built? And if not, what are some of the barriers that um, people who are interested, what are they running into? And are there other opportunities? So if we're going to go back to the policy, yeah. like, let's look at it more holistically and see um, if there are broader challenges. Mm -hmm. um, but also, like, the very specific example that we had tonight that might be making it harder. Yeah, I thank you, Councilmember Carter. I agree with that completely. I know, for example, there's another one where if you're, you have, we have, and I don't know if this is the structure thing or the ADU specific thing, but like, or the, yeah, accessory structure versus ADU, but like we have some, we have some measurement requirements and, you know, size percentages and all that kind of stuff that are also causing other people problems. So it's probably worth looking at whole, holistically. Um, the last thing I was going to mention is just on the fence thing. So we could throw that into the February 12th discussion. I just, I can't for the life of me understand why these circumstances are what they are. So uh, education on my end about like why we have that in the first place um, so that we might change it would be great. Um, so thank you for considering those things. It's so funny that they just happen to be part of the miscellaneous discussion tonight and they have been explicitly uh, resident engagement questions for me over the last three to six months. So, um, timely. The last thing I wanted to mention is just that I did have the opportunity to go to the National League of Cities um, City Summit in Atlanta. I didn't get the chance to talk about this the last time because we were over time and um, it wasn't super relevant. But I did want to, you know, there are a lot of highlights to, to call out there. There's some incredible work being done um, on a number of issues that are relevant to, to, to Bloomington, um, you know, whether that's um, electrification of, of the uh, transportation division uh, grid and and everything. Um, a great discussion I we had with um, with uh, other folks in um, around the country. Um, I think there were something like eighty five hundred of us or something. There it was a very big conference um, uh, that uh, you know we got the chance to talk about all kinds of really interesting things. But I, I had a really engaging discussion with folks about. Um, uh, um, Man, I don't want to call it manufactured housing, but there's some really great options in the world of like um, bringing in, um, you know, kind of that kind of housing and, and doing really cool things with our, our um, uh, you know, um, city owned properties. Uh, so that that's one thing. Um, something that I had on my mind when I thought about the ADU thing, in fact, because they're really cool. Um, the other thing that there's a really interesting conversation in fire safety, uh, which sounds like a really strange thing, about um, electric bicycles uh, because of the lithium ion batteries and charging them in people's homes. And so I don't know if uh, Chief Seal and others have dealt with that yet, but as we think about electrification of, of, our, of our transportation um, and people using EV bikes, Charging them inside, uh, you know, leads to lithium ion fires in some cases. And so there's some standards around that that we might want to consider uh, adopting um, for the purposes of our multi-unit housing. It's it's a I know it so sounds so strange, but it's it's a problem for people um, everywhere because there isn't an adoption of like fire standards on that right now. So something else to think about. Uh, the last thing I will say is Jose Andres was there uh, as one of the keynote speakers. He, if you don't know who he is, um, he runs um, uh, World Central Kitchen, an incredible nonprofit that goes into really, really difficult areas and feeds people. And it was such an honor to be part of the Minnesota contingent because he made the comment of like why he doesn't understand why um, feeding kids 
uh, lunch um, is uh, is a thing that people argue about, and the whole Minnesota contingent was able to stand up and go, we do, and it was really awesome. So thanks again to the state legislature for passing that. That was a big deal, um, and we are first in the nation, and I think a lot of people want to talk to us about how to do that there. Um, uh, I know that's not a local thing, but it does affect our Bloomington kids, and it meant a lot to be able to stand up and, and, and high-five ourselves uh, on that note, um, which, you know, uh, is important. So thank you for the time. Uh, appreciate it. And thanks for representing Bloomington with the National League of Cities. It's well done. Really, oh, by the way, they're in their 100th year this coming year. Uh, so there's a lot of extra activities that will happen. I did get a T-shirt. It's very exciting to say 100 years of city love or whatever it is. I don't know. But it will be in Tampa next time. So Good. Did you get a chance to meet uh, Clarence Anthony? Uh, I have. I've, I've met him before. Yes, oh, okay. and and yes. and uh, he was there, and he was having a blast. I'm sure he was. Yeah, no doubt in my mind about that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Council, anything else this evening? Council Member Lohman and then Council Member Moore. Just real quick, um, if the manager, um, I meant to mention this earlier, uh, could mention something about the trees, because I've gotten a number of uh, uh, emails on 106th Street and 104th, and I'm sure I'm taking your, your thunder on that. But Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, Council Member Moore, the uh, city did receive quite a bit of um, uh, questions from residents uh, this weekend and uh, today uh, after a... Um, uh, obvious cutting of a uh, significant number of trees in Central Park in the area of about 106th and Humboldt. Uh, this is part of a natural resource woodland restoration project that is being uh, done by Hennepin County. We're a partner in that project, but Hennepin County actually um, uh, hired the contractor and is coordinating the project. And the whole purpose of that is to open it um, open that area back up to what is a uh, natural woodland state. And uh, I think some folks were concerned because they saw a significant amount of what was uh, red cedar that had been cut, and it's a large uh, uh, wood that um, is attractive, but it's not native to the particular area. And so what it has done over the course of many decades uh, is actually provide too much um, cover that keeps sun from getting in. It causes soil erosion and a lot of other change in the natural state. So the whole purpose of the Natural uh, Woodland Restoration Project is uh, to do exactly what what the words say, right, is try to restore it to its its natural state, um, which uh, has a number of other trees that provide um, more sun uh, accessibility into the area and um, is better for the, the, the environment and the ecology in that area. Um, now, the thing that I will say is that we uh, typically post uh, signage when we're doing a project like that, and, and we missed doing that this time, and it was just a coordination mistake between us and Hennepin County since they were the ones that are leading the project. Um, and we got signs out there today, uh, and we'll endeavor not to let that happen again. Thank you for the update. Councilmember Member Mouat. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, that was one of my questions. And um, another thing that I was just thinking about today as we were going through the miscellaneous issues that I just threw out there, um, I, I wonder if there's a way or opportunity for us to review our ordinances and policies in general as they age. Um, maybe when an ordinance hits 30 years or 40 years, there's an automatic review to see if it's still relevant because things that were relevant in 1983 or might not be relevant today. And so um, putting that out there as we start looking at how we streamline things, how we make sure that we're working more efficiently um, to make sure that our ordinances are up to date and current and serving the current needs uh, into the future. Good suggestion, Council Member. Appreciate that. Thanks. Is there anything else, Council? If not, Council Member Martin, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Got a motion and a second to adjourn. No further Council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thanks so much, Council. Good discussions tonight. Uh, thanks to everybody who was here and the, and the discussions that took place within the folk within the Council chambers and everybody who watched online. And uh, thank you, Council Member Martin. Enjoy. <laughs>